Welcome to Yahoo Finance this Wednesday, March 20th, and we are moments away from the Fed's decision on interest rates. And if we take a look at markets ahead of the decision, we see really a mixed picture, which is not unusual on a day like this. Uh, that we tend to see a little bit of indecision because people want to know what the Fed is going to do. Today, we know what the Fed is going to do in terms of rates. Nothing. However, what we don't know is what the Fed's so-called dot plot is going to show, Josh. That is their summary of economic projections, or SEP, as some people call it. It basically just shows how many interest rate uh, cuts members of the Fed are going to project this year And each member of the Fed is represented by a dot on the so-called dot plot. Yes. I mean, two things I'm kind of looking for, Julie. So one is um, your inflation expectations. Do those kind of shift? Um, You know, since we last heard from them, different firmer than expected inflation readings we've got, CPI and PPI, how did that influence their expectations going forward? Remember last time we heard from them, they said that key inflation data they would look like to kind of gauge the cool at 2.4% by the end of the year. So does that kind of tick up? And then to your point, following that, how many cuts? You know, they still comfortable with three in 2024 or after that firmer than expected inflation data, does that kind of adjust to two? Right, and we have had some economists start to come out and say, Maybe there won't be any cuts at all yep. this year. And there, still, was one of them. Yeah. I, 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 his base case was still two, but you had right. certain renowned economists like Ardeni saying at least increasing chances of that. Right. Torsten Sock at Apollo, yep. one of the first to say that as well. And this is after a couple of hotter than estimated inflation reports in January and then in February. So, you know, that more good data perhaps that the Fed was looking for, they haven't necessarily gotten it with the same type of, you know, moderation in inflation increases that they've been hoping to see. So that's what we will see how they're reacting. All right, we're sending it over to Jennifer Schonberg, who has the decision. No change. The Federal Reserve holding rates steady in the range of five and a quarter to five and a half percent as officials still see three rate cuts this year. This even as officials revise their outlook for inflation higher this year based on core PCE to 2.6 percent from 2.4 percent previously forecast. Officials also upwardly revising their outlook for GDP sharply to 2.1 percent from 1.4 percent previously. Unemployment now seen finishing the year at 4 percent versus 4 4.1 percent previously. Nine officials now see cutting rates three times this year. That's up from six, while five see two cuts, while five see two cuts and two see one cut. Next year, officials now see only three cuts as opposed to four per, uh, four cuts previously forecast. Officials again cautioning they won't begin lowering rates until they achieve greater confidence that inflation is heading back to their 2% target sustainably. Now, I do want to also mention the neutral rate because that was raised by a hair to 2.6% from 2.5% previously forecast. Remember, that is the rate that neither spurs nor suppresses growth. Now, Separately, on the balance sheet, no changes in language in the statement. Officials said that they will uh, carry forward with plans as previously announced. This decision was unanimous. Back to you. Jen, thank you so much. Appreciate it. So indeed, we see that change in the dot plot that some were looking for. Now only three cuts expected by members of the Fed on average this year, or at least that's where the consensus is sort of coalescing here. Let's do a check of the markets to see how reactions are shaking out. And we should mention a couple of caveats as we look at this market reaction. First of all, the initial reaction is not always the final reaction at the end of the day or even the following day as people sift through these comments and we still have the press conference to go and of course we'll get some reaction to that all of that said we've got the dow making a little bit of a move upward here as we go through the session right but a very small leg upward up 137 points so still a little bit of a waiting game here the same goes for the s p 500 here you can see it a little more dramatically but it's still a relatively small move an increase of a third of one percent and the same goes for the Nasdaq, which is up a half of 1%. Also want to take a look here uh, at what's happening in Treasury futures right now. Here's the 10-year U.S. Treasury futures. You can see it a little bit right on the right side of your screen here with a move upward in price in those futures. That means a decrease 
in rates. And then as we look at the shorter end of the curve, going to pull that up as well. Similar move there. So move up in price, move down in yields here as we look at what's going on. And then also wanted to get a quick check on what's going on with the dollar here, the U.S. dollar index. Little changed here on the day and not seeing uh, much reaction as of yet. But we're going to keep watching all of this, Josh. Now, Drew, let's bring in George Mateo, Key Private Bank CIO, and Andrew Levin, Dartmouth College economics professor and former Federal Reserve Board Special Advisors. Uh, guys, it's great to have you both on the show. And Andrew, let me let me just start with you. So the headline here, the Fed ho holding rates steady, but kind of indicating three cuts still coming uh, at some point this year. Andrew, let's just start your reaction to the headlines of the news here. Um, well, <laughs> I think that um, the dot plot is, is problematic because it only shows a baseline outlook. And that baseline outlook hasn't changed at all. It's almost identical to the projections that the Fed released three months ago. Um, the problem is that there's an alternative scenario in which inflation doesn't settle down close to their target the way they've been hoping. Um, and um, unfortunately, the dot plot just doesn't convey any information about the risk. Um, personally, I've been um, a few <laughs> on this program in December. I said there was a serious possibility that the Fed might not be able to cut rates this year. I still see that as a very significant risk. Um, you look at uh, what's happening to service prices. Um, service price inflation has actually been picking up speed. It's not slowing down, not decelerating. So um, again, uh, what's 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 unfortunate here is that the Fed statement says they're attentive to the inflation risks. But their communications isn't really um, flagging that very, very effectively. Yeah, Andrew, on that point, do you think that Jay Powell will acknowledge that possibility in the press conference today that maybe there are no cuts coming? And can he without sort of causing chaos in the markets? Well, I think um, one thing that will probably come up today is kind of um, pushing back a little bit on the timing of the cuts. Um, the markets are currently expecting that the cuts are going to start in June. Um, what seems more plausible to me is that many Fed officials are thinking of something more like summer, early fall. So they could still cut three times, uh, but that would be September, um, November, December. Um, that would give them some more space to wait through, you know, spring at least to, into summer to kind of really make sure that um, inflation is settling down the way that they're hoping. Um, and if it doesn't, um, then they can wait even longer to, to pull the trigger to start cutting rates. And George, let's bring you in here as well and get your response to this news. Is, is it about what you expected, George? I think it is largely what I expected. I think it's what the market wanted, probably more importantly. Uh, and the market seems to be taking this as good news. To Andrew's point, though, I think the Fed probably missed an opportunity to try and recalibrate policy slightly. I think the market might have been giving them an out if they decided to maybe take a cut away this year. They've kept three cuts in place, though. And I think with good reason, they suggest that maybe they don't have confidence yet to suggest that things are fully back to normal. So we do think that inflation is still going to be somewhat problematic, particularly on the services side. We made a lot of progress. So a year ago this time, inflation was running close to 5%. Today, it's in the high threes, which is still progress. And markets probably anticipated that. But at the same time, we haven't returned to what normal policy rates should be and what the Fed wants them to be. So I think the, the Fed missed an opportunity to try and slightly readjust policy. You're right to point out, Julie, that the fact that the initial reaction is not the final reaction, but thus far, it seems like the markets are taking this as good news and rejoicing that. But I think at some point later this year, we still have to come back to some realization that inflation is not yet cured and needs to be addressed. And Andrew, to come back to you, you know, are you a believer in the so-called idea that the last mile is the hardest here? Is it, you know, we're starting to see gasoline prices cre creep back up? What's going on here? Why is it so hard? Well, I think that an important point here is that we're not on the last mile. And just to underscore this, um, six months and a year ago, Chair Powell was emphasizing what he called super core which was uh, the service sector excluding housing and utilities. Um, super core inflation was looking really good during the first half of last year. It was coming down really fast, um, getting close to what even looked like uh, could be a two or 3% reading, uh, which was very reassuring. The problem now in the last few months is that measure has been going back up 
The latest three month series uh, uh, super core is now at 6%. And the, the 12 month rate is at 4.5%. So um, the, the, it isn't just gasoline prices. The super core are the really inertial parts of the economy, the most inertial, stickiest prices. And so if those are running well above the Fed's target, um, then it could turn out to be very premature for the Fed to start tightening this year. That's, again, it's a risk case. It's not necessarily the base case. And Georgia is the markets guy in the panel. Let me bring you back in here. I'm just curious, George, your take on, does the Fed have to cut for the market to move higher this year, George, or, or no, investors? It, it's not all about the Fed anymore. They're more focused on the economy and corporate profits. Well, Josh, I think the market is largely focused on AI right now, right? I think the Fed has kind of stepped away now uh, to take away at near-term risk. I thought, frankly, coming in today's report, we might see some volatility, perhaps even a sell-off, if, in fact, the Fed adjusted policy, as I suggested they might have. The fact that they didn't do that, however, suggests maybe some summer market participants that it's all clear. Uh, but I agree with you. I think that we still have not really made sufficient progress, frankly, on the inflation side for the market to really feel completely comfortable. I think the Fed also would have to acknowledge at some point that there is this thing called the wealth effect that's happening, and that likely could lead to further spending. We've seen maybe some softness in spending in the first two months of this year. Some of that, I think, is a give back from what we saw at the end of last year, where spending was very robust. But thus far, spending this year has been a little bit tempered, and we've seen consumers reach into their credit cards and other forms of payment to try and really bridge the gap between their depleted savings. But I would suspect that because of the wealth effect, maybe the spending boom that we saw last year might repeat itself in the second half this year. And to Andrew's point, we might have to address inflation and some of the pressures from inflation in the second half of this year still. So, George, does that suggest then that if investors are sort of ignoring the Fed or not paying as much attention to the Fed because they're looking at the AI shiny object, that they do so at their peril, that there is a risk there? Well, I think you have to be careful because I do think that AI is real, and I think there is some long-term staying power behind the AI trend. But yeah, I think at the same time, when you see market multiples approaching 22, 23 times earnings, that gets to be a little bit elevated. And the risk of the fact that there isn't as much risk in the market anymore, uh, I think that also begs the question that we're probably due for a pullback at some point. So I think in the short term, yes, I think that investors should be prepared for some volatility. Long term, however, though, we still think that AI is real, and I think it has a lot of legs on the long term basis to really inflect the economy in a positive way. Andrew, I want to get your take on, on another issue. You know, you'll hear some economists and, and some well-known economists, Andrew, and they'll say, you know, when it comes to the Fed's inflation target, they should be more open to this idea of uh, moving the goalposts, Andrew, that, you know, they should learn to kind of live and love 3 percent. What's your reaction to that? Well, um, the, the Fed actually has a mandate from Congress. It's now more than 50 years old. Um, maximum employment and price stability. And when, when Congress gave that mandate, people thought price stability meant something close to zero inflation. Um, in the 90s, um, Chairman Greenspan said, well, 1% might be OK. Um, in the 2000s and over the last decade, the Fed said, well, 2% is actually a good number. Many other central banks target 2%. Um, that allows a little bit of a buffer. Um, I think that if the Fed were to change the target upward further, it would be a more clear deviation from what the law says. And I think they would have to have congressional hearings to discuss um, either the, either Congress changes the mandate, um, it gives them more latitude to target whatever they want, um, or the Fed has to get you know inflation back down on a sustained basis to what's at least reasonably consistent with price stability. Interesting. And so, George, it, as we all try to figure out what the Fed is going to do here, are you making any changes to your strategy here? As you, you know, are there things that you're going to be listening to specifically from Jay Powell to sort of key off of when it comes to what you're doing with your portfolios? I don't think in the near term we might be loath to make any changes. I so think we want to be balanced towards risk overall. There are certainly elements of the market that are still attractively priced, whereas some of the so-called magnificent seven stocks or maybe the fabulous four are a bit overpriced in our view. But we still think the market is reasonably valued to some extent. And I think the fact we have to recognize is that the Fed is still trying to find their confidence and trying to find where equilibrium should be with respect to the policy rate. 
So there is a fair amount of uncertainty. And for that reason, we're not likely to take risk up, but we're not also likely to take uh, risk down because there are still some signs of hope and some signs of optimism in the economy still. The fact of the matter is that they adjusted their growth target up, I think also needs to be mentioned, irrespective of their outlook for inflation, which as you acknowledge was a tad hotter, but they also adjusted their forecast and their outlook for growth, which essentially is marking to market what we already know. But I think it is validation that there is still some economic strength underlying this economy, which is still quite healthy. Andrew, you're gonna, we're gonna hear from Jay Powell very shortly here. If you were at that presser, Andrew, What's the one question you would have for Mr. Powell? Well, again, it would help. We'll probably, another, by the way, I was one of the people who worked with Ben Bernanke and Jack Ellen when we designed the dot plot um, a decade ago. But there's always room for improvement. And I think another limitation of the dot plot is it just shows kind of the end of the year without giving any sense of timing. It would be constructive today if Chair Powell would clarify the likelihood that the first cut's probably not coming till late summer, early fall, that would help the markets, I think, at this point. They, I think part of the market risk that I see is that every FOMC meeting over the next you know, few months, the Fed keeps pushing back the market expectations incrementally um, to a later meeting, later meeting, later meeting. And um, that that would probably create some downward pressure, um, given all the other strengths uh, that uh, that George has mentioned. Yeah, well, we'll see if part of that happens today. Andrew, George, thank you so much, guys. Really great to catch up with you. Thank you. For more on what we heard from the Federal Reserve already today, three rate cuts forecast uh, for 2024, what this means for investors. Let's get to Michael Kushma, Morgan Stanley Investment Management, CIO and Broad Markets Fixed Income Head. Good to see you, Michael. Thanks so much for being here. So sort of first plus reaction here. Um, do you think that the Fed is managing the uh, market's expectations appropriately? Uh, I think they're, they're doing a good job of steadying the ship that there's no change in their long-term views about inflation, which has been underperforming or too high in recent months relative to what people thought is more a blip. It's more an outlier because the 2025 forecast, they will be at the where they thought they'd be uh, three, three months ago. So no change in their long-term view that disinflationary process is on track. They do not have to adjust monetary policy in any significant way this year um, in order to achieve those targets. So it's steady as she goes. There's no reason to think that we're not going to achieve our objectives. So in that sense, steadies the market. There's no surprises. Everything's OK in sense on track. Michael, they did um, just looking at the projections here for core inflation that that did uh, tick up a bit here. Two point six percent. I'm just interested when you look across 2024, the trajectory of inflation. What, it, what does it look like to you, Michael? Well, I think they were, they, were, they were realistic in terms of marking up a bit because the first quarter of this year has been quite disappointing. I think, you know, core PC was up 0.4% January and, and February. And that is you know, way too high to achieve that low two number at the end of the year. So I think that they've, they've bought into the idea that this is more of a blip. But when we return to that disinflationary process we saw in the fourth quarter of last year, we were ticking along at almost a little below target, a 1.6% annualized rate. Now we've accelerated uh, higher. If you look at sort of a meeting, a, a moving average trend of that, it still looks down. Um, I did think it was interesting that they took out you know, a rate cut in 2025, that the terminal rate for 25 for Fed funds is a little bit higher than it was before. I think acknowledging the fact that growth is stronger than expected. You know, they've, they've upgraded their growth forecasts across the board and raising the long-term equilibrium Fed funds rate is reasonable given the growth of the economy seems to be has more potential than expected. So, how, Michael, how do they make the argument that, that they should be cutting with the inflation projection still at two point six percent? I think it's the it's the trend in the trend in the economy. If you look at sort of models that that people have typically used to, to think about how the Fed sets interest rates, there are things called you know, Taylor rules. We we'll look at their relationship of unemployment to full employment, the relation of inflation to target inflation. Those models all suggest that the Fed should be cutting interest rates a bit this year. Is it three cuts? Is it two cuts? But rates are probably high enough or even too high to achieve that objective over time. In other words, if they didn't cut three times, inflation may be too low down the road. In other words, they have to keep adjusting the Fed funds rate down 
as inflation continues to drift lower, otherwise policy passively tightens over time. So I think that's kind of what, what, what they're saying. Policy is more than sufficiently tight right now. Models would suggest it can ease at the margins, but no big time easing anytime soon. It's more of a glide path than any aggressive abruptness in terms of cut rate cuts. Michael, I'm looking at the yield on the on the 10 year to at 429. Michael, uh, curious where you see that headed in, in the sort of the near to intermediate term here. It's it's pretty tough for it to move much any which direction from current levels. Uh, if the Fed continues to cut rates, well, cart begins to cut rates as expected. Um, Fed funds rates gets down to you know four and something, but the 10 year is 429. Shouldn't the yield curve be positively sloped with long term yields higher than long term short term yields? And right now, it's, it's difficult to see that given the trajectory of monetary policy or Fed funds rate that we're looking at. So I think you know, the 10-year yield is stuck somewhere between the very high threes, 3.8, 4.3, where we are. It may not go a whole lot higher um, if, the, if inflation continues to get better. But as we heard from earlier, inflation has to get better. Q1 inflation's negative surprises have to go away. We have to resume that 0.2% per monthly numbers for core PC you know, pretty quickly. Otherwise, the year-end number will be in jeopardy. Michael, um, you mentioned um, the yield curve inversion, but, you know, at least between the tens and twos that we continue to see. Is that just broken as a predictor of recession? Should we just not pay attention to it anymore? I mean, it's been inverted for a while now. For, for a very long time. Yeah. It's one of the longest periods of inversion we've seen. I think it reflects a couple of factors. One is the temporariness of most of the inflation shock. It, it is going away. It's taking time, and people are confident that inflation will, will drop to lower levels. It also reflects that the attractiveness of bonds at current levels um, is pretty good. And real, the real interest rates, as indicated by the TIPS market, is almost 2%, and a 2% real rate of turn on a U.S. Treasury certificate. So, uh, security is very attractive by historical standards. So that, that absolute level of long-term yields looks pretty attractive to longer-term investors who are looking through the last couple of months or the next couple of months and say, yeah, I could get more yield in two years, but why not lock in these higher yields? I don't know how, don't know how long they'll last um, at current levels. Plus, we do know the Fed has done a lot of QE over the last couple of years, and that, in theory, should be suppressing risk premium, term premium, and suppressing long-term yields relative to short-term yields. That should put some upward pressure medium-term as QT you know, continues to uh, unfold. Michael, I'm interested for fixed income investors who are listening right now. What, what are the areas you would, you would guide them to avoid right here? Well, I think it, uh, to avoid being too bullish on bonds, expecting some big drop in interest rates. The economy is doing just fine. Things are ticking along. Don't expect any 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 major economic downturn such that we'll have a, a major bond rally you know, from 4.3% all the way down to 3% um, at any point in the future. And that while the risk assets, particularly the stuff that we look at in terms of the credit markets, investment grade credit, high yield credit, seem pretty well supported moving into a Fed rate cutting cycle when the economy is doing just fine. So the Fed's cutting rates not because growth needs it, just reflecting the fact that inflation is headed towards the target of where it needs to be. And that should be very supportive of, of risk assets in the economy. So don't get too bearish on, on risk assets. Don't get too bullish on interest rates. At the same time, Michael, you know, we've talked to some investors who have also said, you know, the money market flood that we've seen, the money into money markets um, because of the yields there should start to reverse. The people should start looking to the more risky areas of the market. But as the Fed pushes it off and pushes it off and pushes it off in terms of rate cut, are we going to see those flows actually be more, more persistent, perhaps? Uh, it's, it's, it's certainly possible. I think that a lot of retail investors, myself included, um, look at what do I get for extending maturity you know, out of money market instruments or very short date instruments out the yield curve. And if you don't get paid a reasonable extra premium, why should I bother? Unless I'm, I'm trying to lock in a long-term attractive absolute yield, saying, I don't know when this is all when the Fed's going to cut rates. I don't know when yields are going to come down. But if I lock in these yields today, longer term, it looks pretty good. So pension funds, insurance companies, liability managers would look at the level of treasury yields and investment grade yields in sort of the 10-year longer sector. Look, 5.5% corporate bond yields look pretty attractive from a longer term perspective. So I think there will continue to be a trickle of money out. But I think that it will not see a big reversal until we get some a reversal of the inversion of the yield curve. Michael, it is always great to have you on the show today. Thanks so much for joining us. Welcome.
The Fed's uncertainty about the state of the economy still looming ahead of today's Fed decision. Few expecting the Fed to cut rates, so many shifting focus to the dot plot, something our next guest says she has zero confidence in. For more, we bring in Sam Consulting founder and former Federal Reserve Board economist Claudia Sam. Claudia, it is good to see you. So zero confidence in the dot plot, Claudia. Walk us through that. How come? It's not a useful tool for communication. There is so much attention today. Is the median going to be three cuts or two cuts? And markets could have moved if it switched. I mean, two people would have had to change their forecast. And I think what we forget is the dot plot, the median in particular, it is not the consensus forecast for the FOMC. You have 19 people running off, doing their own projections, and then doing their appropriate policy. It's a neat little exercise. It's fine for in the building. It should not be out in public. And thank goodness, j Powell definitely kept it together. This is a boring dot plot, and this is a boring statement. Yay, good. We need more data before we get excited. Um, and it's funny, Claudia, about the dot plots, because we talked to Andrew Levin a little bit earlier, who said, you know, he was one of the guys who helped them construct it in the first place. And even he is saying, eh, maybe we need to rethink this situation. So do you think that the Fed does need some type of publicly facing forecasting tool like this? Or do you think, no, they should just get rid of it and, you know, bring it back into the meeting rooms and that's it? They need Jay Powell at the press conference. That's it. Right. He can give the message across and get like that. He speaks for the FOMC. Those dots do not speak for the FOMC. Those dots are like playing Fed chair for the day. And in fact, it's even worse. It's like playing FOMC for the day. Right. This is not the way we should communicate. They are highly technical. I know why Andy put it together. I know why Ben and Janet did. They're great for macroeconomists. I could spend hours on it thinking about what they mean. This is not what markets should be doing at two o'clock on a Wednesday that the Fed has you know, put out their statement. So Jay Powell is absolutely capable of doing this. And I'm so happy we're not going to sit through a press conference of him fighting with these dots. Claudia, their projections for, for inflation did tick up a bit here. I'm interested, how do you see inflation playing out in 2024? I agree with their trajectory. Inflation is coming down. We're likely going to learn at the end of this month that PC core inflation was 2.8% or something right around there. It has been steadily coming down. Yes, the last two months on inflation have been disappointing. So have the last two months on retail sales. Right? We are seeing signs of demand flagging. The Fed has a dual mandate. This Fed is fully aware of that. And so we've really gotten a mixed bag of disappointing news off out of the gate. I think they're right. It's going to be a little slower. It's been a slog getting inflation down. And yet we all agree this is where it's going. And the data, even the last couple months, if you look under the hood, this is where it's going. We're getting back to two. So when is that happening, Claudia, right? I mean, I know, you know, we talk about like how uneven this all is. We talk about long and variable lags in terms of the effects of the interest rate uh, increases through the system. But, you know, I think also, you know, your confidence notwithstanding, I think a lot of people, especially consumers, right, are having trouble getting their arms around and understanding why it is not coming down further and faster. And the root of all evil in this cycle has been COVID. I mean, we lived through an extremely disruptive uh, experience, both in our lives and livelihoods. Frankly, I want to put it in the rear view mirror, too. People making decisions about economic policy, like the Fed, cannot. Like, they have to understand the disruptions. They have to watch them work out. It's been really hard to see it. But last year, it was very clear inflation came down a lot, not enough, but a lot, and we kept the labor market going, unemployment was low, growth was high. So that's a really clear sign. And I do not expect the regular person to get this, but that is such a clear sign. That was COVID, that was Putin. We're unwinding it, it is very slow, but we're a really big economy. I mean, to work things out, this is not trivial, but we're, we are so headed in the right direction. And last year was the turning point. Their economic outlook, Claudia, it looks like that also improved a bit, too. Uh, looks like uh, projected change, real GDP for 2024, Claudia, 2.1%. Looks like that's up from about 1.4% in December. Does that kind of track with what you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, the Fed's just catching up with reality. I mean, you know, we have, again, last year, many people thought we would get inflation down, including the Fed. The Fed thought we would get inflation down and we would see slower growth. Right, below trend growth. We saw the absolute opposite. We had really fast growth. And there's a lot of reasons why that can continue. We have some higher productivity growth. And this is the Fed giving a nod to the fact that, no, this economy, it's got something going. 
and yet we still have inflation coming down. So I, honestly, the Fed is, they're learning. They learned from last year. We didn't have to slow it down as much. We can get inflation down. It's a good forecast. I mean, this is what we really want to have hold up. Inflation's coming down, maybe a little slower. Growth is high and unemployment is low. I mean, if we do this, this will be a great year. Claudia, do you think that the Fed will be cutting this year in, in June, in July? I mean, we, as we've been talking about throughout the show, there are some economists who are now saying, we might not even get any cuts this year. The Fed has been very clear, and I'm sure we will hear this mantra again soon. It's all about more good data, right? They need more good inflation data. And thus, nobody can forecast that. We've done a bad job of that so far. Now, we are on a path, and if if we are on this path of getting at least okay to good data, then yes, they will cut. Frankly, this like June versus July, this is like really splitting hairs. I am on the side of July just because I think the Fed is going to drag their feet until it is painfully obvious. And yet I still think if they start in July, they could do three cuts. Right? There's nothing magical about every other meeting. And frankly, as an institution, they do not care who wins in November. Like they care about and, and are by law bound to their dual mandate. So yeah, I think summer, frankly, I think they should be cutting sooner than that. But you know, the Fed is the Fed. <laughs> the Fed is the Fed. Claudia, we always love talking to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Well, as Claudia alluded to, we're expecting to hear from Jay Powell in just a few moments, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, in his press conference when he will likely be discussing all of these issues that we have been discussing for the past half hour. He will be fielding questions from the media. As you can see, we have seen the major averages take a little bit of a leg up and then sort of stay there. We could see more movement in them, of course, as we get through the conference. And as we are uh, watching the markets, we have to talk about fixed income, too, because we saw yields go down. Really, we are not seeing a lot of change there either. So, Josh, it's interesting, this sort of... You know, I mean, I wouldn't call this sideways exactly, but it's not like it's a big move after no, what I mean, was, as Claudia said, a boring statement. That's what she was looking for. She was happy the for the Fed boring statement. The Fed is the Fed. That's it. That's the Claudia's. The that's okay, I mean, right. you know, that's like don't fight the Fed. It's another way of don't saying fight the don't Fed. fight the, the Fed. Fed. Yeah, I mean, look at the yield on the benchmark, 10 years flat. No fireworks right now. The market seems to be kind of taking it all in stride. You see just kind of modest moves across the major averages up about... You know, the SBX is up about three tenths of a percent right now. Um, it'll be interesting to see um, Jay Powell, um, kind of the tone he strikes. As Claudia was just saying, you know, they did kind of tick up their inflation expectations. Um, I think we can be sure he's going to say, listen, I kind of trajectory is going right, but I need to see a bit more good data. Yeah, I mean, the other thing that's interesting that both she and Andrew Levin talked mm -hmm. about is that the dot plot should be taken with a grain of salt. And that's actually something that Jay Powell mm -hmm. has said before, right? Don't take it as gospel. Um, now, are they going to change it anytime soon in the way they release it? Uh, I would say probably not imminently because yeah. they usually signal these things before they do it. Um, but nonetheless, it's an interesting um, question, and I'm sure he will be getting some questions about that dot plot. Yeah, you know another, I thought it was interesting, we, we touched just very briefly with Claudia about mm -hmm. another subject which is a very divisive election coming. She, and he's always claimed, of course, he's staying independent. Could get a good question on that too. There he is, Jay Powell, let's listen in now. Good afternoon. My colleagues and I remain squarely focused on our dual mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. The economy has made considerable progress toward our dual mandate objectives. Inflation has eased substantially, while the labor market has remained strong. And that is very good news. But inflation is still too high. Ongoing progress in bringing it down is not assured. And the path forward is uncertain. We are fully committed to returning inflation to our 2% goal. Restoring price stability is essential to achieve a sustainably strong labor market that benefits all. Today, the FOMC decided to leave our policy interest rate unchanged and to continue to reduce our securities holdings. Our restrictive stance of monetary policy has been putting downward pressure on economic activity and inflation. As labor market tightness has eased and progress on inflation has continued, the risks to achieving our employment and inflation goals are moving into better balance. I will have more to say about monetary policy after briefly reviewing economic developments. <clears throat> 
Recent indicators suggest that economic activity has been expanding at a solid pace. GDP growth in the fourth quarter of last year came in at 3.2%. For 2023 as a whole, GDP expanded 3.1%, bolstered by strong consumer demand as well as improving supply conditions. Activity in the housing sector was subdued over the past year, largely reflecting high mortgage rates. High interest rates also appear to have weighed on business fixed investment. In our summary of economic projections, committee participants generally expect GDP growth to slow from last year's pace, with a median projection of 2.1% this year and 2% over the next two years. Participants generally revised up their growth projections since December, reflecting the strength of incoming data, including data on labor supply. The labor market remains relatively tight, but supply and demand conditions continue to come into better balance. Over the past three months, payroll job gains averaged 265,000 jobs per month. The unemployment rate has edged up but remains low at 3.9 percent. Strong job creation has been accompanied by an increase in the supply of workers, reflecting increases in participation among individuals aged 25 to 54 years and a continued strong pace of immigration. Nominal wage growth has been easing and job vacancies have declined. Although the jobs to workers gap has narrowed, labor demand still exceeds the supply of available workers. FOMC participants expect the rebalancing in the labor market to continue, easing upward pressure on inflation. The median unemployment rate projection in the SEP is 4.0 percent at the end of this year and 4.1 percent at the end of next year. Inflation has eased notably over the past year, but remains above our longer run goal of 2 percent. Estimates based on the Consumer Price Index and other data indicate that total PCE prices rose 2.5 percent over the 12 months ending in February, and that excluding the volatile food and energy categories, core PCE prices rose 2.8 percent. Longer-term inflation expectations appear to remain well anchored, as reflected in a broad range of surveys of households, businesses, and forecasters, as well as from measures from financial markets. The median projection in the SEP for total PCE inflation falls to 2.4 percent this year, 2.2 percent next year, and 2 percent in 2026. <clears throat> the Fed's monetary policy actions are guided by our mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation imposes significant hardship as it erodes purchasing power especially for those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials, like food, housing, and transportation. We are strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2 percent objective. The committee decided at today's meeting to maintain the target range for the federal funds rate at 5.25 to 5.5 percent, and to continue the process of significantly reducing our securities holdings. As labor market tightness has eased and progress on inflation has continued, the risks to achieving our employment and inflation goals are coming into better balance. <clears throat> we believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle, and that, if the economy evolves broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. The economic outlook is uncertain, however, and we remain highly attentive to inflation risks. We are prepared to maintain the current target range for the federal funds rate for longer, if appropriate. We know that reducing policy restraint too soon or too much could result in a reversal of the progress we have seen on inflation and ultimately require even tighter policy to get inflation back to 2 percent. At the same time, reducing policy restraint too late or too little could unduly weaken economic activity and employment. In considering any adjustments to the target range for the federal funds rate, the committee will carefully assess incoming data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risks. The committee does not expect it will be appropriate to reduce the target range until it has gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably down toward 2 percent. Of course, we're committed to both sides of our dual mandate, and an, un an unexpected weakening in the labor market could also warrant a policy response. 
we will continue to make our decisions meeting by meeting. In our SCP, FOMC participants wrote down their individual assessments of an appropriate path for the federal funds rate based on what each participant judges to be the most likely scenario going forward. If the economy evolves as projected, the median participant projects that the appropriate level of the federal funds rate will be 4.6 percent at the end of this year, 3.9 percent at the end of 2025, and 3.1 percent at the end of 2026, still above the medium, median longer-term funds rate. These projections are not a committee decision or plan. If the economy does not evolve as projected, the path for policy will adjust as appropriate to foster our maximum employment and price stability goals. <clears throat> Turning to our balance sheet, our securities holdings have declined by nearly $1.5 trillion since the committee began reducing our portfolio. At this meeting, we discussed issues related to slowing the pace of decline in our securities holdings. While we did not make any decisions today on this, the general sense of the committee is that it will be appropriate to slow the pace of runoff fairly soon, consistent with the plans we previously issued. The decision to slow the pace of runoff does not mean that our balance sheet will ultimately shrink by less than it would otherwise, but rather allows us to approach that ultimate level more gradually. In particular, slowing the pace of runoff will help ensure a smooth transition, reducing the possibility that money markets experience stress and thereby facilitating the ongoing decline in our securities holdings consistent with reaching the appropriate level of ample reserves. We remain committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2 percent goal and to keeping our longer-term inflation expectations well anchored. Restoring price stability is essential to set the stage for achieving maximum employment and price stability over the long term. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for me. Steve Leesman, CNBC. Mr. Chairman, um, <clears throat> the uh, projections show somewhat higher core inflation. They also show uh, somewhat stronger growth. Um, what should we infer from this notion that, on average, rates were kept the same this year, but Inflation is higher and growth is higher. Does it mean uh, more tolerance for higher inflation and less of a willingness to slow the economy to achieve that target? Well, it, it doesn't. No, it doesn't mean that. What, what it means is that you know we uh, we've seen incoming uh, as you as uh, as I pointed out in my opening remarks, we did mark up our growth uh, forecast, and so have many other forecasters. So the economy is performing performing well. Um, and the inflation data came in a little bit higher as a separate matter, and I think that caused people to write up uh, their, their inflation. Um, but nonetheless, we continue to make good progress on bringing inflation down. And uh, so. When, when you, uh, just to follow up, when you say that you're willing to either maintain the rate for longer, is what is the tolerance of the Federal Reserve for inflation coming in above its 2 percent target? So we're, we're strongly committed to bringing inflation down to 2 percent over time. That is, that is our goal, and we will achieve that goal. Markets believe we will achieve that goal, and they should believe that, because that, that's, what, that's what will happen over, over time. But we stress over time. And so um, I think we're, we're making projections that, that do show that happening, and we're, we're committed to that outcome, and we will bring it about. Rachel. Hi, Chair Powell, Rachel Siegel from The Washington Post. Thanks for taking our questions. You and others have been saying that relief on housing inflation is coming, but it still hasn't shown up meaningfully in the CPI or the PCE. Does that challenge your assumption about when the shift will finally break through, since it hasn't at that point? So I think there's some confidence that, that, uh, that the market rents, lower market rent increases that we're seeing will show up in measures of housing. Uh, services inflation over time. There's a little bit of uncertainty about when that will happen, but there's real confidence that they will show up eventually uh, over time. But again, uncertainty about the exact timing of that. And will you be able to get overall inflation down to target if housing doesn't break through quickly, and does that affect the timing for eventual cuts this year? We will get aggregate inflation down to 2 percent over time. We will. 
and and uh, I would assume that what we'll continue to see is we'll see goods prices coming into a new equilibrium where they're going down perhaps not as quickly as they had been earlier this year, uh, where housing services inflation will come back down as 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 current market rents are suggesting will happen, and where non-housing services will move back down. Some combination of those three things, and it may be different from the combination we had before the pandemic, will be achieved and will bring inflation back down to 2 percent sustainably. Nick. Nick Timoros of The Wall Street Journal. Chair Powell, during your congressional testimony this month, you said that your test for making the first change to interest rates does not require you to be terribly comfortable that inflation is at 2 percent because interest rates are well above neutral. At the same time, you said here after the last meeting that the first cut is highly consequential. Can you reconcile these views for me? If rates are well above neutral, why would the first cut be highly consequential? Is that because you anticipate one cut would be followed by one or two more along the lines of the recalibration you made in 2019, which itself was modeled on the mid-cycle adjustment of 1995? It's more, I, I would put it more in the context of what I said in, our, in my opening remarks, that the, the risks are really two-sided here. We, we're, we're in a situation where you know, if we ease, uh, if we ease too much or too soon, we could see inflation come back, and if we ease too late, we could do unnecessary harm to employment and uh, you know people's working lives. And so, you know, we do see the risks as two-sided. So it is consequential. We want we we want to be careful. And fortunately, with the economy growing, with the labor market strong, and with inflation coming down, we can approach that question carefully, and let the data speak on that. Uh, that, that's really what I was thinking. How much of that inflation that we've seen so far this year do you chalk up to one-off calendar adjustment effects following a period of high inflation versus some change in the trend we saw uh, in the second half of last year? So I, I want to start by being saying you, I, I always try to be careful about dismissing uh, data that we don't like. So you need to check yourself on that, and I'll do that. But so the, but the, I would say the January number, which was very high, the January CPI and PCE numbers were quite high. There's reason to think that, that there could be seasonal effects there. Um, but nonetheless, we don't want to be completely dismissive of it. The February number was high, higher than expectations, but we have it at, at currently well below 30 basis points core PCE, which is not terribly high. So it's not like the January number. But I take the two of them together, and I, I think they haven't really changed the overall story, which is that of inflation moving down gradually on a sometimes bumpy road toward 2 percent. I don't think that story has changed. Um, I also don't think that those, those readings added to anyone's confidence that we're moving closer to, to that point. But, uh, you know, we didn't, I, I, the last thing I'll say is we didn't um, uh, excessively celebrate the, the good inflation readings we got in the last seven months of last year. We didn't um, take too much signal out of that. What you heard us saying was that we needed to see more that we could, you know, we wanted to be careful about that decision. And we're not going to overreact as well to these, these two months of data, nor are we going to ignore them. Um, hi, yes, Chair Powell. Uh, I, um, could you speak a little bit more about the timing? Uh, is there um, enough data uh, between now and, say, May to be able to get the kind of confidence that you say that you know, you still need, um, or by June, um, is there enough data for you? Just give us a sense of your thinking there. Thank you. Yeah, so we're, we're, we make decisions meeting by meeting, and we didn't make any decisions or uh, about about future meetings today. Uh, those are going to depend on our ongoing assessment of, of the incoming data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risk. So I've, I really don't have anything for you on any specific meeting. Looking forward. But, I mean, just a question of, I mean, is there even enough data for you to be able to? We'll, we'll take, um, you know, th things can happen during an intermeeting period, if you look back, unexpected things. So I don't want to, I wouldn't want to dismiss anything. So I just would say that the committee wants to see uh, more data that gives us higher confidence that inflation is moving down sustainably toward 2 percent. I also mentioned. Uh, and we don't see this in, in the data right now, but if there were a significant weakening in the data, particularly in the labor market, that could also be a reason for us to to begin the process of reducing rates. Again, I don't. There's nothing in the data pointing at that, but those are the things 
that we'll be looking at at coming meetings and it, without, without trying to refer to any specific meeting. Hi, uh, Chris Rieger, Associated Press. Thank you. Um, in the projections, there is an increase in the neutral rate, as you know, and uh, higher rates, a quarter point higher rates projected in 2025, 2026. 20, um, can you speak about why might be behind that? Is there a real sense here that the economy has perhaps changed in some way that uh, higher rates will be needed in the future? Thank you. So. You're right. They're pretty modest changes, but you're right. There was an uptick in the, in the longer run rate, and um, uh, and also there's a 25 basis point increase in, in 25 and 26. In terms of um, are rates going to be higher in the in the longer run? If that's really your question, I, I don't think we know that. Um, I, I think uh, it's it's we think that rates were generally low during the pre-pandemic, post-global financial crisis era for for reasons that are mostly, you know, uh, important, slow-moving, large things like demographics and productivity and, and, and that sort of thing, things that don't move quickly. Um, but I don't think we know. I mean, I, my, my instinct would be that rates will not go back down to the very low levels that we saw where all around the world there were long-run rates that were at or below zero uh, in some cases. I, I don't see rates going back down to that level, but I think there's tremendous uncertainty around that. Great. And just a quick follow on the projections, you also have 2.6% uh, core inflation for the end of this year. Uh, it's already at, or you mentioned it being 28 in February. I mean, that doesn't sound like much disinflation at all. So are you really, are you still confident? Or <laughs> the last press conference, you sounded pretty optimistic you would get more confidence to the end of this year. Um, it, is it right to say that this suggests you're not seeing a lot of disinflation this year compared to what we've seen 2023 and so, so forth? I think that that, that higher year-end um, number reflects the data we've seen so far this year, because you're now, you're now in this year. So um, uh, I think that, um, sorry, say, your, say your, your last part of your question again. Well, just, are you still optimistic that you'll ah. get the confidence you need this year? I, I you know. I, I think if you look at if you look at the SCP, what it says is that um, it is still likely in in in, in most people's uh, view that we will achieve that confidence and that there will be rate cuts. But that's really going to depend on the on the incoming data. It is. Um, the other thing is in the second half of the the year you have some pretty low readings, so it might be harder to make progress as you move that 12 month window forward. Nonetheless, um, we're looking for data that confirm the kind of low readings that we had last year uh, and, and give us a, a higher degree of confidence that what we saw was really inflation moving sustainably down to 2 percent, toward 2 percent. Uh, Gina Smilek, The New York Times, thank you for taking our questions. Uh, per your comment to Anne that a weakening in the labor market would be a reason to potentially cut rates or at least a consideration in making a rate cut, would continued strength in the labor market be a reason to hold off on rate cuts? And just in general, if labor supply continued to rebound in 2024 the way it did in 2023, what would stronger hiring and possibly stronger growth mean for the path forward on policy? Yeah, so so if, we're, if what we're getting is... Um a lot of supply and a lot of demand, and that supply is actually feeding demand because workers are getting paid and they're spending, and that's, you know, you, you, what you would have is potentially uh, kind of what you had last year, which is a bigger economy where, inf where inflationary pressures are not increasing. In fact, they were decreasing. So you can have that if you have the continued supply side uh, ac activity that we had last year with uh, both with um, supply chains and also with, with uh, growth in the size of the labor force. But so strong hiring in and of itself would not be a reason to hold off on rate cuts? No, not, not all by itself, no. I mean, we, we saw, you, you saw last year, very strong hiring, hiring and inflation coming down quickly. We now have a better sense that a big part of that was supply side healing, particularly with, with um, growth in the labor force. So in and of itself, strong job growth, growth is not a reason, uh, you know, for us to be concerned about inflation. Neil. 
uh, High Chair Powell, Neil Irwin with uh, Axios. Uh, how do you assess the state of financial conditions right now? And in, particularly, in, in particular, do you uh, view the kind of easing in financial conditions since the fall as consistent and compatible with what you're trying to achieve on the inflation mandate? So we think <laughs> there are many different financial conditions indicators, and you can kind of, uh, you know, see different answers to that question. But ultimately, we do think that um, financial conditions are, are weighing on economic activity, and we think you see that in a great place to see it is in the labor market, where you've seen demand um, cooling off a little bit from the extremely high levels. And there I would point to job openings, quits, surveys, uh, the, 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 um, the hiring rate, things like that are really demand. There are also supply side things happening, but I think those are demand side things happening. Um, you know, we saw, that's been a question for a while. We did see progress on inflation last year, uh, significant progress, uh, despite, uh, you know, financial conditions sometimes being tighter, sometimes looser. Mike, I'm with uh, <coughs> Bloomberg Radio and Television. Can you give us uh, more color uh, on how the committee is thinking about inflation dynamics now? Uh, what we've seen at the beginning of the year, are they more one-off increases that will fade, or is there more of a secular turn uh, with goods prices rising again and service prices staying sticky? And also, housing prices have been sort of the godot of this uh, cycle in that you keep expecting them to go down and they don't. Uh, how does the committee see this playing out forward since you've raised your uh, inflation forecast? So I, I see the committees looking at, at the two months of data and asking the same question you're asking and saying we're just going to have to see what the data show. Uh, as I mentioned, you can look at January, which is very high reading, and you can, and I think many advise, many people did uh, see the possibility of seasonal adjustment problems there. But again, you don't want to, you got to be careful about dismissing the, the parts of the data that you don't like. So uh, yeah. um, then February wasn't, wasn't as high, but it was higher. So the question is, what are we going to see? You know, we tend to see a little bit stronger, this is in the data, a little bit stronger inflation in the first half of the year, a little bit less strong later in the year. We're going to, the, we're going to let the data um, show. I don't, I don't think we really know whether this is a bump on the road or something more. We'll have to find out. In the meantime, the economy is strong, the labor market is strong, uh, inflation has come way down, and that gives us the ability to approach this question carefully and, and you know, feel more confident that inflation is moving down sustainably at 2 percent when we take that step to begin dialing back uh, our restrictive policy. Well, you've talked about the, the desire to have confidence that inflation is continually moving down. Has the recent uh, numbers we've gotten for inflation data dented that confidence at all? It certainly hasn't improved our confidence. It hasn't raised anyone's confidence. But confidence. But I, I would say that the the um, the story is really essentially the same, and that, and that is of inflation coming down gradually toward 2% on a sometimes bumpy path, as I mentioned. I think that's what you still see. We've, we've got nine months of 2.5% inflation now, um, and we've had two months of kind of bumpy inflation. We, we were saying that we'll, it's going to be a bumpy ride. We consistently said that. Now here are some bumps, and the question is, are they more than bumps? And we just don't, we can't know that. Um, that's why we are approaching this question carefully. It is very important for everyone that we serve, that we do get inflation sustainably down. And uh, I think the, the historical record, you know, it's every situation is different, but the historical record is that you, you need to approach that question carefully and, and try to get it right the first time and not have to come back uh, and raise rates again, perhaps, if you, if you cut inappropriately, prematurely. Go to Edward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Edward Lawrence uh, with Fox Business. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, you received a, a letter from, um, well, the Federal Reserve is an independent body, understanding Congress has oversight over that. You received a letter from Senators Elizabeth Warren and Sheldon Whitehouse that said, um, calling on you to lower interest rates, to cut interest rates, because it says, quote, the potential that it may remain too high for too long has halted advances in deploying renewable energy technologies and delayed significant climate and economic benefits from these projects. So has higher interest rates caused that? 
have the well, first of all, I respect our, you know, we in our system of government, it is Congress that has oversight responsibility over the Fed. We place a tremendous amount of importance on our engagements with Congress and always treat them with, with great respect. Um, in, in this case, I would say those are, you know, our mandate, our mandate is for maximum employment and price stability and the other things that we do. Uh, and that's what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to do that in a way that sustains the strong growth we're seeing, the strong labor market we're seeing, but allows us to make further progress with inflation. That's how we can best serve the public and leave the other issues, in, which in many cases are incredibly important, such as those you mentioned, leave those to the people who have responsibility for those. There was another letter from two dozen lawmakers <clears throat> saying that the higher rates are squeezing the working people. How do these letters affect what you guys are doing policy-wise? We, we, we receive these, respect, these letters with respect, and we write careful responses and address concerns. We listen, again, because we're talking to the people who, in our system of government, have oversight over our activity. So that's, but, but at, the, at the end of the day, we take that on board, but we have to make our judgments, and we have to stick to our knitting, which is maximum employment, price stability, supervise and regulate the banks, work on the payment system, the things that we do. Uh, Claire. Thank you. Claire Jones, Financial Times. Um, thanks a lot for the opportunity to ask a question. Um, as, as chair of the FOMC, would you want to see unanimity on the committee or something close to it, meaning no more than one dissent before you begin cutting rates? Thank you. I, I, we're a very consensus-oriented uh, organization, and we do try to achieve con, uh, consensus and, and ideally unanimity. People do dissent. It's something that happens. Life goes on, and it's not a problem. We've always had dissents. Uh, but, and so I, you know, and you, you, you respect thoughtful dissents very much. Um, it's like, you, you may not agree with, with some arguments, but you really want to understand them. So you may read a book that takes a position that you, that you have long opposed just to understand that book. So I, I treat dissents with, with real respect as well. Simon. Uh, Simon Rabinovich with The Economist. Um, can you hear me? Yes. OK. Great. Um, obviously, inflation is some ways away from target. Uh, unemployment, though, if you look at the projection for the full year, 4.0%. 4 uh, in February, uh, we were already at 3.9%, so quite close to the median projection. Are you concerned at all that notwithstanding the very strong jobs growth, um, that in fact there may be some cracks appearing in the employment market? Uh, you talked about a significant deterioration in the labor market being a condition for, for easing rates. What would constitute uh, that in your books? Thank you. So uh, we, of course, monitor the, it's one of our two goal variables. We, we all monitor the labor market very, very carefully. And I, I don't see those cracks today. And, and we, you know, we follow all the possible stories that are out there about, about there being cracks. But the, the overall picture really is strong labor market, the extreme imbalances that we saw in the early uh, parts of the pandemic recovery have mostly been resolved resolved. You're seeing high job growth. You're seeing big increases in supply. You're seeing strong wage growth, but wage growth is gradually moderating down to more sustainable levels. Uh, in many, many respects, um, the uh, things are returning more to the, their state in 2019, which we can think of as normal for this purpose. That's job openings and quits. And surveys of workers and, and businesses are always interesting on this. You know, how tight is the, how easy is it to find a job? How hard is, how easy it is to find a worker? Those have both, those surveys have both come down. So the labor market's in, it's in good shape. Um, you know, uh, you do see things like the low, uh, the low hiring rate. And people have made the argument that if, if, um, if layoffs were to increase, uh, that that would that would mean that the net would be fairly quick increases in unemployment. So that's something we're watching, but we're not seeing it. Of course, um, initial claims are are very very low, and if anything, have tracked tracked down a little bit. So, watching it carefully, don't see it. And when I say uh, something, I, I, I use the term unexpected weakening in the labor market. So, you know, uh, we do expect the unemployment rate to 
you know, the forecast is that it would move up, I think, closer to what we see as the longer run sustainable level. That's just a that's just people's forecast, individual forecasts. But um, we're talking about something that's unexpected. That's that's where I'll leave it, though. Uh, Steve Matthews with Bloomberg. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the press conference that it, that the committee felt it might be appropriate to slow the pace of asset runoff fairly soon. I'm wondering, is when you say fairly soon, does that mean that the committee would uh, meet about this again in May and a decision could be reached that soon? And I was wondering if you could also just describe the, the scope of what the committee is discussing here. You're at $95 billion of, of uh, uh, caps right now. Would that be cut about in half or something in that nature? Thank you. Um, so that is what we're discussing, essentially, is, is um, and we're not discussing all the other many other balance sheet issues. We will discuss those in the in due course. But what we're really looking at is is uh, slowing the pace of runoff. There isn't much runoff among MBS in MBS right now, but there is in Treasuries, and we're talking about going to a lower pace. I don't want to give you a specific number because we haven't made a, a haven't made, had an agreement or a decision. But that's that's the idea, um, and uh, that's what we're looking at. And, and the, in terms of the timing, I said fairly soon. I wouldn't want to try to be more specific than that, but you get the idea. Um, the, the idea is, and this is in our, in our longer run plans, that we may actually be able to get to a lower level because we would avoid the kind of frictions that can, can happen. It, liquidity is not evenly distributed in the system. And there can be times when, in the aggregate, reserves are, are ample or even abundant but not in every part. And, and those, those parts where they're not ample, there can be stress. And that can cause you to prematurely stop the process to avoid the stress. And then it would be very hard to restart, we think. So as something like that happened in, in 19, perhaps. So, um, so that's what we're doing. We're looking at what would be a good time and what would be a good structure. And you know, fairly soon is words that we use to mean fairly soon. And will there be a discussion about returning to an all treasuries balance sheet at some point? So that our our longer run goal is is to a return to a, a balance sheet that is mostly treasuries. I do expect that once we're through this, um, we'll we'll come back to the other issues about the composition and the maturity and revisit those issues. But it's you know not urgent right now. We want to get want to get this uh, this decision made first and then we can when the time is right, come back to the other issues. Victoria. <clears throat> Hi, Victoria Guido with Politico. Um, also on the balance sheet, um, you know, can you talk a little bit about how the outlook for the banking sector might impact your balance sheet plans? Do you worry that as deposits start to shrink that we could see more <laughs> turbulence? You know, we'll, we'll be watching carefully, but one of the reasons we're we're slowing down. We will soon enough, uh, fairly soon, I should say, slow down. Is that uh, we want to avoid any any kind of uh, of of that of turbulence. I wasn't thinking particularly about about banking sector turbulence, but um, we and we we had some indicators uh, the last time. This is our second time in, in in doing this, and I think we're we're going to be paying a lot of attention to the the things that started to happen and, and that foreshadowed what eventually happened at at the end of that tightening cycle where we where we wound up in, in a short reserve situation and we don't want to do that again and i think now we have a better sense of what are the indicators it isn't it wasn't so much in the banking system as it was around for example um, where federal funds is trading relative to the administered rates and where where secured rates are relative to the to the administered rates those sorts of things we will always be watching the banking system for for similar signs, though. Well, is it also because you're not sure exactly how the reserve supply will react once the overnight reverse repo facility, you know, drops nearer at zero? I, well, I think we broadly think that once the overnight repo uh, stabilizes either at zero or close to zero, that as the balance sheet shrinks, we should expect that reserves will decline pretty close to dollar for dollar with that. That's what we think. Gene. Hi, Chair Powell. Gene Young with m and Market News. Um, I wanted to ask also about the balance sheet. Um, 
Well, you you said that starting the taper sooner could get to get you to a smaller balance sheet size. Um, does that mean you don't have to make a decision on when to end QT at this point? And and um, will you be setting up um, the process for deciding that sooner, or, or will you wait until we're close to the end? So uh, it's sort of ironic that by going slower you can get farther, but that's the idea. The the idea is that. Um, with a smoother transition, you won't, you'll run much less risk of uh, kind of liquidity problems, which can grow into shocks and which can cause you to stop the process prematurely. So, so that's, that's where, in terms of how it ends, um, we're going to be monitoring carefully uh, money market conditions and asking ourselves wh wh whether they, what they're telling us about reserves. Are they, from, we, right now we would characterize them as abundant. And what we're aiming for is ample, and you know, which is a little bit less than abundant, right? So um, there isn't a, you know, there's not a dollar amount or a percent of GDP or anything like that where we, we think we have a really pretty clear understanding of that. We're going to be we're going to be looking at what what these, you know, what's happening in money markets, uh, in particular, a, a, a bunch of different indicators, including the ones I mentioned, to tell us when we're getting close. Then, though, you, re you reach a point ultimately, where you stop uh, allowing the balance sheet to run off and you, but then from that point, there's another period in which non-reserve li non liabilities grow organically like currency. And that also shrinks the reserves at a very slow pace. So you have a, you have a, you know, a, a slower pace of runoff, uh, which we'll have uh, fairly soon. Then you have another time where, you've, where you, you effectively hold the balance sheet constant and allow non-reserve liabilities to expand. And then, and then that, that ultimately brings you ideally in for, you know, bring, brings it into a, a nice easy landing uh, at, an, at a level that is above, you know, above what we think the lowest possible ample number would be. We're not trying for that. We're, we're, we want to have a, a cushion, a buffer, because we know that demand for uh, reserves can be very volatile. And we, we don't want to, again, find ourselves in a situation where there aren't reserves. We have to turn around and, you know, buy assets and put reserves back in the banking system the way we did in 2019-20. Hi, Nancy Marshall Genser with Marketplace. Chair Paul, um, you said you're waiting to become more confident that inflation is getting to your 2% goal before you cut rates. Can you just sum up more specifically what data you're looking at that would give you that confidence? Sure. So we're, most importantly, we're looking at the incoming inflation data and the contents of it and what they're telling us. So that'll be, and also the, the various components. So obviously that's what we want. We want more confidence that inflation uh, is coming down sustainably toward 2%. Uh, and I mean, it, it, of course, we'll also be looking at all the other things that are happening in the economy. We'll look at the totality of the data, including everything, essentially, as we make that assessment. But the most important thing will be the inflation data that coming in. Well, are there things that you would give more weight to, like wages? Wages is one thing. We don't. Our, our target is not wages. It's really inflation. We would, but we would we would look to the fact that. Um, Wages are still coming in very strong, but but they've been wage increases. That is to say, wage increases have been have been quite strong, but they're they're gradually coming down to levels that uh, are more sustainable over time, and and that's what we want. Uh, we don't think that the inflation was not originally caused. We think I don't think by by mostly by by wages. That wasn't really the story. Um, but we do think that to get inflation back down to 2 percent sustainably, we'd like to see, you know, continuing gradual movement of wage increases at, at still high levels, but back down to levels that are, that are more sustainable over time. Thank you, uh, Greg Robb from MarketWatch. Chair Powell, could you say at this meeting whether there were more of officials who wanted to be careful and go slower than about rates than were in at the last meeting was there was there that sense of maybe it's a, it's smart to to wait thanks i, I guess i put it this way um, the if you look at the incoming inflation data that we've had 
for January and February. I think very broadly that um, suggests that we, we were right to, to wait until we're more confident. So I think, I think you know, I, I didn't hear anyone dismissing it as, as not information that we should look at or anything like that. So I think, generally speaking, it does go in the direction of saying, yes, it's, it's, it's appropriate for us to be careful as we approach this question. Brendan. Thanks, Chair Powell. Brendan Peterson with Punchbowl News. Um, I wanted to ask you about central bank digital currency stuff. Um, we've been hearing a lot from Republicans in Congress about what the Fed is or isn't doing in a digital dollar. Um, but, folk, I know you have said to Congress that you are going to wait for approval before the Fed does anything, uh, launches anything. But folks like House Majority Whip Tom Emmer have said that the Fed is either actively researching or hiring personnel to study the implications of the CBDC. Can you give us any clarity on what the Fed is doing right now on a digital dollar? Sure. So I think we've been pretty transparent on this, but I will, uh, I'll try harder. Um, so we, uh, we are not getting ready to, we haven't proposed, we haven't come to a conclusion that we should propose or anything like that, a, th that Congress consider legislation to authorize a digital dollar. And it would take legislation by Congress signed by the president to, to give us the ability to do the, what we think of as a CBDC, which is really a retail CBDC with, with the public of it. So, so we're just a long, long way from that. What we are doing, and I think what every major central bank is doing, is we're, we're trying to stay in the frontiers of what's going on in digital finance. And it has many, many different uh, areas. You know, it, it has applications in wholesale finance, in, in the payment system. And so we need we to serve the public. We need we're, these these issues have become very front burner in the last five or six years. We need to be knowledgeable about all that. So we, we actually do have people trying to understand things that are. But but it's wrong to say that we're working on a CBDC and then we've got secretly got a lab here where we've got one and we're just going to spring it on Congress at the right moment. We don't. Not I, I haven't at, at all in my own mind. Uh, made a decision that I think this is something the U.S. should be doing. Uh, I, you know, I just think it's something we need to be, we need to understand. And we do have people who are keeping up with that as part of the broader payments landscape. That's, that's how I would characterize it. Mark. Thank you. It's Mark Hamrick with Bankrate. Mr. Chairman, April 27th will mark the 13th anniversary since a Fed chairman began holding regular news conferences. How important has that higher transparency been in your view, both for the proper functioning of the central bank uh, and also in accomplishing your mission? And is there more that you and your colleagues can do on the transparency front? And what might that look like? I, I generally think um, I mean, this, this movement actually started, you know, 30 years ago, more 30 years ago, um, when some academics uh, posited that a more transparent central bank, if the public understands your reaction function, the markets will do your work for you. They'll react to the data. And, and so it all happens that way. And so there's been a march toward greater and greater transparency. And um, that certainly Chairman Bernanke advanced that. So Chairman Greenspan did, uh, Chair Yellen did. And I, you know, so we went from Four, four press conferences a year to eight, so now every, every meeting really is live now. I think that's a good innovation. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to turn it back. We also have done a bunch of other things. Uh, you know, we've, we have an annual uh, supervision report, financial stability report. Um, I mean, there's a long list of things that we've done. I think you, um, I mean, nothing comes to mind as really desperately in need of doing at this moment. We're very transparent. We have no shortage of FOMC participants speaking to the public through the media, and so that that channel is full. I would say, um, so I think I think it's generally broadly helped and made things better, but not every day and in every way. Well, to follow up, has there ever been a day where you wanted to put that genie back in the bottle somewhat? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to Jennifer for the last question. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Powell. Jennifer Schoenberger with Yahoo Finance. Uh, 
not to harp too much more on confidence and inflation, but she did say earlier in this press conference that the recent inflation data hasn't raised anyone's confidence. But when you testified before the Senate a couple weeks ago, you told lawmakers that you are, quote, not far from receiving the confidence needed on inflation to begin cutting rates. So are you still of that belief or not? What are we to take by those words, not far? So let me say my, my main message at that um uh, in those two days of hearings was really that the, com the committee needs to see more evidence to build our confidence that inflation is moving down sustainably toward our 2 percent goal. And we don't expect that it will be appropriate to begin to reduce rates until we're more confident than that is the case. I, that, that is the case. I said that any number of times. So those were kind of the main part of the message. We repeated that today uh, in our statement. I also, to the language you mentioned, I, I, I really pointed out that we had made significant progress over the past year. And what we're looking for now is confirmation that that progress will continue. Um, uh, we had a series of, inf of um, inflation readings over the second half of last year that were, that were really uh, much lower. Uh, we didn't overreact, as I mentioned, but that, that's what I had in mind. But given that you said that PCE for February, 2.8 percent, the estimate, and that we have been seeing PCE, core PCE, coming down by a tenth of a percent every month, I mean, wouldn't you be at about 2.4 percent this summer, June, July, to a point where you could cut then? Well, you know, we'll just have to see how the data, uh, how the data come in. Um, we would, of course, love to get great inflation data. We got really good inflation data on the second, in the second part of last year. Again, we didn't overreact to it. We said we needed to see more, and uh, we said it would be bumpy. And now we have January and February, which I've talked about a couple of times. So, you know, we're looking for, for more good data, and we would certainly welcome it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to Market Domination on Yahoo Finance. Jay Powell there speaking after the Fed held interest rates steady and made no changes to its forecast that it will be necessary to cut rates three times in 2024. If we take a look at markets here, they seem to like it. And in fact, we see markets extending on an earlier rally. All yeah. three major averages are now set to close at a record uh, today. So obviously nothing to upset the apple cart. I no, think. I mean, the stock market clearly likes what, what it sees and hears today. I'm just looking at the major average here, Julie. I mean, the Dow's tacking on 360 points. The S&P 500's up about eight-tenths of a percent, broke above 5,200 for the first time. NASDAQ is up more than 1%. You know, I mean, clearly like what they heard here, the Fed penciling in three cuts this year. And I think there's just relief there. You know, we had heard maybe, you know, there was hot talk after because firmer than expected inflation prints we got, CPI, PPI. Maybe it would be two cuts. It's not, and that is supporting risk assets. Yeah, it is. I mean, again, it looks, feels like the nothing to change substantially the view of what the Fed was going to do. I mean, of course, the the most sort of uh, off the cuff part of the press conference mm. came close to the very end where a reporter asked uh, Chair Powell if he how he felt about the transparency, the <laughs> yeah. press conferences right. yeah. that the Fed does, if he has any regrets that they changed that. And he said, of course not. <laughs> that pause, perhaps saying a lot, because of course transparency has been helpful to markets mm -hmm. at times, but it also sometimes muddies the waters and makes his job harder in terms of managing the message. And that also speaks to the commentary that we got from Claudia Sam and mm -hmm. Andrew Levin earlier that the dot plot is problematic for the Fed um, because the market ascribes so much importance to it. Yeah, I mean, and the market is ascribing importance to it. I mean, th these moves here, we were kind of talking off camera, Julie, about how when you see market reactions like this, this is a boost to financial conditions. You just kind of wonder how much, I mean, look at that screen. You kind of wonder how it complicates Jay Powell's, you know, right. work ahead. Yeah, just like George Mateo was saying earlier, when markets go up, you get the wealth effect. Right. People's propensity to spend may be going higher, which is not something that the Fed needs necessarily right now. We were just talking about the importance of the Federal Reserve's dot plot. It was indeed in focus ahead of today's decision, and the central bank is still looking at three cuts this year. Yahoo Finance's senior reporter Alexander Canal joining us now with a breakdown. The dot plot 
more technically known as the Summary of Economic Projections, Allie. Yeah, Summary of Economic Projections, the SEP, the Fed releases that data quarterly. The dot plot is part of that. And as you were just talking about, heading into this two-day policy meeting, all eyes were on this dot plot. The Fed also releases projections for other economic indicators like GDP, unemployment, inflation, but interest rates have been the big biggie. So let's start there. So as you can see, each dot here represents a specific FOMC member. By and large, the central bank does expect interest rates to tick down over time. Uh, as you can see, the further we go, my handy dandy, there we go, it's not working here, but the further we go, there's more dispersion because it's harder to predict things deeper into the future. So let's focus in on 2024 this year. The majority of members here expect interest rates to come down to 4.6%. We are currently right in this area, um, which means that interest rate cuts will likely come in three stages, 325 basis point cuts. This is the same uh, projection that we heard in December. But notably here, only one FOMC member expects interest rate cuts of more than 75 basis points. And if you compare that to December, there were five FOMC members. So this mantra of higher for longer is likely going to continue. I mentioned some of those other economic indicators. GDP was probably the biggest change here. The Fed revising its GDP estimate, saying that it expects GDP to come in at 2.1% in 2024. That's significantly higher than the 1.4% that uh, the December projections said. And then eventually we're going to hit that 2% through 2026. And and if you take a look at inflation, that also coming in higher in these projections here, core PCE expected to be 2.6% in 2024. We're not going to get to that 2% target until 2026. Jerome Powell has consistently said that the Fed's path uh, when it comes to getting to 2% inflation, it's going to be bumpy. And we're likely to see that throughout the next few years. And then finally, unemployment. That has been a big story when it comes to inflation. We have remained below 4%. We're currently at 3.9% unemployment, but the Fed does expect that over the long run to tick up to 4.1% with 4% in 2024. So by and large, not too many surprises here. There was a lot of talk whether or not we could see projections of just one or two cuts, but that wasn't the case. Again, we got those three cuts um, that was expected. We'll see ultimately if that happens this year, but markets right now really championing uh, these projections and that the Fed has held right steady so far. For sure, Ali Canal, thank you so much. For more on the latest Fed moves and what it means for investors moving forward, let's now welcome in Roger Aliaga Diaz, Vanguard Global Head of Portfolio Construction. Roger, it is good to see you. So we have a rally here on Wall good. Street, uh, Roger. I'm looking here, just green across the screen, all three major averages. S&P 500 breaking above 5,200 for the first time, Roger. But let's get your reaction. What, what did you make of, of what the Fed did and said today? Yeah, no, I think the, the market reaction is understandable. Uh, at the surface, the, the SCP that we, you guys were just describing, is, it seems very dovish, right? So they uh, revise up the growth projections, they revise up the inflation projections. They were at 2.4 before, they're at 2.6 now, yet they still think they will cut three times this year, right? So that, that is a very dovish signal to the market. And I say the surface because Below, below the surface, like how uh, the different dots move, shows a little bit more uh, less less uh, uh, easy. Roger, it's Julie here. Dare I say Goldilocks? Is it time to bring back that word? Well, um, it's certainly Goldilocks was last year, um, and the the question is if if those same uh, supply side forces that Powell referred to in the in the conference will continue, right? Uh, uh, b because with, with higher growth, uh, this time has comes higher inflation, right? So um, whether whether we're going to uh, have that uh, tailwind that, that really allowed the Fed last year to have high growth with lowering or decreasing inflation is, is still yet to come. In our view, um, uh, the inflation will remain stubborn. Um, we think that the Fed has more revisions to do in terms of the, of the rate cuts. We, we feel that it's going to be very difficult for them to get to that first cut unless the inflation picture really starts uh, moving downwards. To that point, Roger, you know, I, I want to ask you this question. You know, when you see 
the stock market reaction like this, th this is a boost to financial conditions, Roger, right? I mean, doesn't this, doesn't this complicate Jay Powell's work ahead? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I think um, uh, financial conditions, wealth effects are, are, are things that, that should be factored in. Um, and that's, um, uh, it's a form of policy mistake in some, in some sense, uh, in a slight way, right? Um, uh, because by moving up the growth and inflation projections, yet saying that they are going to cut the same, they are sending a, a, an easy signal to the market, which in turn, as you suggest, makes the job more difficult uh, to, to bring inflation down, which is ultimately what they want. So put it all together for us. Risk on for the for as far as the eye can see, Roger. What you know? What are the sort of risks to this continued rally, and you know, sort of exemplified by the reaction that we're seeing today? Yeah, no. To to me, the, the risk is basically, and we have seen it since since December. Honestly, um, uh, that the markets are are uh, buying this idea of a soft landing, declaring victory too soon, in our view. Um, I think uh, uh, basically we will have to get back to reality at some point. If inflation continues uh, being stubbornly uh, high or not lowering enough, eventually the Fed will have to postpone and put off the, the date of the first cut more and more. And that's where we can see a little bit more volatility in the market. So that's, that's a risk that I think as investors we need to keep in mind. And Roger, I'm interested in another issue here. You know, we, we do have a very divisive election coming up here. I'm just wondering to what extent, if at all, you think that's also impacting the Fed's decisions. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the problem I think would be when, with the timing of the first cut, if it falls right there in, in the September timeframe, it, it would complicate things, right? Uh, not that the Fed is not going to uh, do what they need to do uh, based on, on, mon on monetary policy, but Ultimately, the, the, the pressure and the criticism they will receive, whether they do it or they don't do it, um, will, will, be, they will put them in the public scrutiny, right? So that, that's going to something that may limit a, a little bit what, what they can do. Roger, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. No, I appreciate it. Always happy to have you. Thanks. Well, we've just heard from Jay Powell confirming that the Federal Reserve is holding rates for an eighth straight month. Our own Jennifer Schomburger was in the room, of course. She got in the question there and brought up the rear here. And she's joining us live from Washington. So what was your impression there from being in the room, from sort of seeing Jay Powell in person? Um, and as you've had a few minutes, at least, to digest what you heard. Just a couple minutes there, Julia. Yeah, I thought it was very interesting that Chair Powell and the Fed don't really seem to be phased all that much by the hotter inflation data that we saw in the first two months of this year. Uh, he says it really doesn't change the overall inflation picture for the Fed all that much. Now, does it inspire greater confidence? No, not exactly. Take a listen to what he said. We have it at, at currently well below 30 basis points core PCE, which is not terribly high. So it's not like the January number. But I take the two of them together, and I, I think they haven't really changed the overall story, which is that of inflation moving down gradually on a sometimes bumpy road toward 2%. I don't think that story has changed. Um, I also don't think that those, those readings added to anyone's confidence that we're moving closer to, to that point. And now Powell would not show his hand on the timing for the potential first rate cut and whether June may be even pushed back. Uh, when asked about that, he just said decisions are going to be made on a meeting by meeting basis, though I thought it was interesting because the chairman used language that he's been using all year to categorize timing, saying that it would be appropriate quote, at some point this year to begin dialing back policy restraint. He didn't shift to using language like later this year that some of his colleagues have chosen to use. So that indicates to me that June is still very much in play if the inflation data softens some more from here uh, and continue following as they have uh, when it comes to core PCE on a month over month basis. Now on the balance sheet, uh, the chairman said that the members of the committee did have a discussion on this, but they did not make any decisions today. They believe though that it will become opportune to slow the pace of quantitative tightening quote fairly soon. Uh, that doesn't mean he says though that the Fed will end up with a larger balance sheet. In fact, they could still end up with a smaller balance sheet, guys. Jen, were you, were you, you know, you've been at a lot of these pressers, you've covered them so closely. Anything from the meeting today, anything Jay Powell said that surprised you, Jen? Anything that surprised me? I mean, I thought it was interesting that he just would not touch 
timing and that even though they have upgraded their assessment of the economy and inflation, that they are still retaining three rate cuts this year. Having said that, you know, we did see some of the doves that were seeing four uh, rate cuts previously back in December now coalescing more towards that median of three cuts. But for the most part, the fact that they still see easing that much, I think, is, is quite interesting and telling, given that he also said that they don't feel the holistic picture for inflation has changed all that much, even though we've had those hotter inflation data for the first two months of this year. Jen Schomberger, thanks. Appreciate it. All right, it's time to take a pause from the Fed and turn to one of the day's trending tickers as we approach the closing bell on Wall Street. We are watching shares of Intel. Now, the shares are only up about a quarter percent, but we got the news today that the U.S. will provide the company up to $8.5 billion for chip manufacturing as part of the Chips and Sciences Act. CEO Pat, Gel Pat Gelsinger saying this is a defining moment as the U.S. and Intel work to power the next chapter of American semiconductor innovation. The company also said it might tap into more money in terms of tax incentives and loans. Here with more on where this place is Intel in the competitive semis landscape, let's bring in CFRA Research Senior Equity Ange Analyst Angelo Z Zeno. Angelo, can't even talk after the Fed. Good to see you. Thank you so much for being here. So, you know, we broadly expected that Intel was going to get one of these grants, right? Um, so what now <laughs> in terms of what, how this affects the investable case for the company? Yeah, so um, no, thanks for having me, Julia. And listen, you, you kind of look at how much they received here, about eight and a half billion. And my guess is this, the stock isn't moving much, pretty much because it was um, in line with where I think we anticipated and where most people out there anticipated at about eight to 10 billion or so. Uh, maybe some others were maybe even hoping for a little bit more. But that said, um, you know, this is a company that's going to spend, you know, in excess of $100 billion in terms of CapEx spend, in terms of kind of um, expanding and, and building their foundry uh, business. We saw, we saw them spend north of $20 billion in each of the last two years. We expect them to spend north of $20 billion this year and each of the next two years. So um, this is a company spending massively. That, that $8.5 billion is going to help, but at the end of the day, I mean, they're going, they are going to need to continue to essentially utilize all their um, cash flow that they're generating from their core business into continuing to kind of build this, uh, you know, foundry expansion uh, initiative out there. So as we kind of look here over the next couple of years, um, we do expect them to potentially be a number two or three player on the foundry side of things where Taiwan Semi will continue to lead. Um, but you listen, I, what everyone's hoping for and looking for right now, if you're an investor, is you're looking for more, um, you know, wins from a customer perspective. I think they've got total lifetime um, deal value uh, was announced about a month ago, about 15 billion or so. That's not much out there. So um, we need kind of we need to see more in terms of the order side of things from Intel. You know, Angelo, you look at Pat Gelsinger, who's been CEO there now for three years. Um, you know, came in with this turnaround plan, um, big turnaround plan, you know, focus on design, on manufacturing. He said from the beginning, you know, Angela, you know this, he said he, he thought it would take about five years. So when we're yeah. halfway through, you know, as just a financial analyst covering the company, Angela, I'm curious what, what grade you give Gelsinger so far. How, what do you make of his performance? Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I think he's been given a very, very difficult hand, right? Um, I think he's done the most he can, could with it. I think he's making um, all the right moves out there. I, you know, this isn't a company that's necessarily going to be a winner on the AI side of things, but I do think you know they're kind of uh, where they do hold a competitive advantage relative to others is kind of their their, their manufacturing presence. So um, the kind of the being able to kind of see some of the geopolitical pressures out there, the need to have another player out there um, outside of Asia, I think is the right move, and I think ultimately they are going to. To win a lot of business. The reason we've had a, a hold recommendation over the last three years is because we knew this was going to be a five-year plus uh, plan. And as a result, if you're an investor out there, the opportunity cost of having a, or, or owning Intel relative to essentially any other company in the semiconductor ind industry, especially some of these AI-oriented companies like in, uh, in NVIDIA or AMD, is absolutely huge. So, um, you know, we give him, you know, an A minus, let's say, but at the end of the day, he was given a very difficult hand and it's not necessarily his fault while you haven't, you know, that you haven't seen the, the capital appreciation in terms of the stock performance. 
Um, Angelo, of course, Intel's not the only company that's likely to get one of these grants, right? You know, Global Foundry's already got one. Taiwan Semi, we know, Samsung, Micron um, have applied. Now, to be fair, those are in different parts of the semiconductor stack, if you will. But sort of how do the competitive opportunities look for some of them versus an Intel from getting these grants? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. So, I mean, it, all those companies will probably get some sort of funding. Um, we do, at the end of the day, expect Intel to, to be that that winner in terms of kind of uh, getting the majority or, or at least kind of the largest piece of that pie. I think another name out there um, that wasn't highlighted, Texas Instruments, also we think it will, you know, we'll get a, a good amount on the, on the funding side relative to what they've been spending um, on an annual basis here as of late. But um, you know, as far as the, the foundry side of things, it, it will be Intel here. If you look at Taiwan Semi, actually, um, as of late here, they've actually kind of pushed out some of their initiatives. I think they're kind of taking more of a wait and see approach to see what type of funding that they will uh, or support they will actually get from the U.S. government out there. But uh, make no doubt about it, um, all the leverage right now, at least from a funding pers perspective, will continue to go to Intel. Angelo, good to see you. Thanks so much for helping us break this down. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks for having me. Silicon, we're taking a look at how to view the latest, uh, how to what to do in the latest clean energy push, and if it's time to get into the space. That's in today's investor playbook. Stick around. More market domination on the other side.
Taking a look now at shares of Chipotle, the board of the fast casual restaurant chain, approving a 50 for one stock split. And look at that nice little 4% pop today, Julie. So that, that was the news that uh, Chipotle's board proposing a 50 to one stock split. First split in this company's history. Of course, the stock goes public back in 2006 at 22, now trades for around 3,000. Uh, not a bad return. Not bad for burrito chain. Shareholders, I guess, gonna be asked to approve this split at this annual meeting in June 6th, and the split shares would then start trading on June 26th. Yes, and you know, what we like to say about a split is that the pros don't necessarily like this. It doesn't do anything for the fundamental value of the company. It's more a, a, a move uh, aimed at retail investors who can better wrap their brain around buying something that is not 2,900 bucks a pop, but rather is a 50th of that. Yep. Um, and so that's why you see these kinds of moves. There have been fewer stock splits recently, but we have seen companies like Walmart do them also, you know, trying to sort of court retail investors. And so it's interesting to see that positive uh, reaction in today's shares. Yeah, I also saw Chipotle, by the way, also given a one-time equity grant to restaurant general managers and crew yes. members who worked there for more than 20 years. And I saw some analysts saying that to them, this was a kind of a positive signal, kind of speaking to management confidence. You are mm. the last man in America who yeah. has not had Chipotle. I really have to I try think, this. I mean, maybe I, there's I, other people out there. Really if you're out to, there, <laughs> please tweet at me. I want to make it clear. Because I think he's the only guy. I want to make it clear. I'm not anti-Chipotle. Right. I, I just, just I'm, haven't I just it. haven't sampled it yet. Not that I can remember. Although the more we're talking about right now, the hungrier I'm getting. So oh, that's I'm a sorry. Good sign. We shouldn't talk about it anymore then. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it's quite, it's not bad. It's quite good. All right, let's talk about another trending ticker we're watching. That is digital world acquisition surging in today's trading. The company filing a lawsuit to try to force ARC Global Investments to vote in favor of its merger deal with Trump Media and Technology Group. The shares up 22%. This is a very, very volatile stock, first of all, up mm -hmm. and down, right? Um, and the saga of DWAC has been, now been going on for quite some time. There is a vote scheduled for Friday finally, mm. to see if a merger will get done. It's been pushed back, there's been maneuvering, and so this is the latest to try and get it over the finish line. Yeah, basically, so this is, basically this is digital world telling ARC, you have no choice, right? You, 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 and I think the money line of the lawsuit was ARC must vote in favor of the merger pursuant to this sort of terms of the letter agreement. There are no exceptions, despite ARC managing uh, member Patrick Orlando's desire to hold ARC's vote hostage for his personal gain. So a lot of that's a drama around That's what they say anyway. This. Yeah, that's what they say. Yeah. Interesting, uh, Bloomberg pointing out, by the way, if this went through, yeah. it would be a windfall for Trump. I mean, $4 billion potentially to former President Trump. At a time when through. he could use the money because for he's sure. got a that lot of legal handy, fees. Yes, yes, because given just the legal verdicts, huge financial penalties for sure. Yes, exactly. Well, switching gears here to the energy industry. It's gathering in Houston for the annual Sarah Week by S&P Global Conference. I was there earlier this week. I got the chance to hear from some leaders across the sector and the message that came through loud and clear Fossil fuels are not going anywhere anytime soon. The CEO of pipeline operator One Oak, for example, Pierce Norton, he told me that energy needs will only grow over the next few years. To meet that demand, he says, the focus will be on adding energy sources, not just transitioning to new ones. We've actually been in a transition for 200 years. The country started out actually using wood, you know, for its energy source. And then we added coal, we added natural gas, we added nuclear, and then now you've got geothermal, you've got uh, the renewables, which is the solar and the wind. We believe it's more about energy addition uh, than necessarily energy transition. But these big names are taking steps to clean up, so to say, by investing in offsetting emissions. One way of doing that is by capturing carbon, carbon dioxide, and storing it underground out of the Earth's atmosphere. It's part of a business the industry calls Carbon Capture, Utilization, and Sequestration, or CCUS. I also talked to Chris Powers. He's the vice president of CCUS at Chevron, and he talked about the profitability or lack thereof of this technology. He acknowledged it's very early days, but he says the path has been laid out. The 45Q credits through the IRA, I view those as a, uh, as a foundational enabler to get these businesses moving. And if you think about it, it's not really that much different than what some of the other industries, solar and wind, they also had uh, policy enablement to get started and then the businesses grow and scale over time, cost curves come down, and then the businesses can grow into a market. 
Amid talk of decarbonization and the clean energy push, the question remains, is the energy transition a smart investment right now? We're looking at how to navigate that big picture with the Yahoo Finance playbook. I'm joined by Rob Thummel, Tortoise Senior Portfolio Manager and Managing Director, and Drew Pettit, City Director of U.S. Equity Strategy. Guys, thanks so much for being here, first of all. Really appreciate it. Um, Rob, I want to start with you, because when we talk about the energy transition here, there are a lot of different ways to get into it, but broadly speaking, is it something that investors should be looking at right now as an investment? <coughs> well, I think, Julie, good, good to see you and good to see Josh as well. So I think ESG is fading a bit, but decarbonization globally is not, and, and it will continue. And I think decarbonizing the world is, is something that's important to all of us, to, no matter what our age. Um, and so as a result of that, yeah, I do think that the companies are looking to decarbonize. And when you're looking for companies that are decarbonizing, you know, it, really, it's the energy companies themselves that are really making significant strides in, in decarbonizing through a variety of ways, some of which you've already highlighted. I want to come back to that in a minute, but first I want to get Drew's view on this as well, because it's not just about the energy companies when you're talking about the transition, or at least not just oil and gas companies specifically. It's also about solar. It's about wind. It's about other types of energy sources. So how should investors be thinking about it right now? I'll actually take you a step further back here. I think we have to think about the value chain first. When we're thinking about this thematically, a lot of the pure plays, they're having a little bit of a difficult time uh, proving out their business models. But I think if you go back in the value chain, we have to build the infrastructure first. I always find this a little bit quippy, but it's, it's interesting. There are wind farms that don't really make a ton of money but I can almost guarantee you the company pouring the cement at the base of that windmill probably didn't lose on that contract. So I think from an investment standpoint, we want to move back in the value chain. We want to invest in the infrastructure build for energy transition right now. And, and Drew, let me just um, extend that a little bit. Have we seen those types of businesses also get an added boost from the Inflation Reduction Act because there has been new investment in that industry? And how have they maybe taken advantage of that? So a lot of people talked about this, but I don't think a lot of the street and analysts put it into their numbers. So honestly, yes, it should be a tailwind. IRA should be a tailwind for these companies. But I think there was a lot of skepticism around it because a lot of IRA, again, politically driven. We're in election year. There's a lot of uncertainty there. But the structural trend, regardless of politics, is still in place for energy transition and infrastructure build out across energy and just infrastructure in the United States more broadly. Um, I, I want to come back to you for some names there, but first I want to go back to Rob, because here too, of course, the IRA is important, it, actual investment when you're talking about this decarbonization push because of credits, because of increasing basically the value of carbon credits that these energy companies are trying to get a hold of. Um, that said, it's not really, a, the business doesn't really exist yet, <laughs> right? I mean, these build-outs are very early on, Rob. So if I'm, if I'm buying an ExxonMobil for its carbon capture business, I mean, when am I going to see profits for that? <laughs> yeah, well, it's a little ways out, and obviously ExxonMobil in its carbon capture business is going is going to be it's it's going to take a little while for it to make a meaningful impact. But but think about this, Julian, and it kind of dovetails into a little bit what Drew's saying. Last year, uh, Exxon Mobil bought Denbury. Well, you say, well, what does that mean? Well, Denbury actually uh, had the largest network of CO2 or carbon dioxide pipelines in the U.S. And so Exxon paid five billion dollars to buy a company like Denbury. So now Exxon is the largest. Uh, uh, really, operator of infrastructure for, for carbon dioxide. So what our Exxon can now do is take a lot of carbon dioxide off of the industrial plants in the Gulf Coast, transport it in the pipelines, and actually ultimately sequester it, like you were talking about earlier. But you need that infrastructure in place to really reduce the cost. So it's examples like that of, of, of opportunities. Occidental is another example that's doing direct air capture. They're going to take advantage of the IRA, get get some of the opportunities for the 45Q, the tax credit that, that people were referring to earlier. That business could grow, and they expect it to be as large, potentially, and a significant uh, provider of cash flow, maybe as, as significant as its chemicals business, which is a billions of billions of dollar business for, for Occidental. Maybe, Rob, I think is the key word there. I mean, I just talked with, with Vicki Holub um, in Texas of Occidental, the CEO of Occidental, and I said to her, when is this going to make money? 
And she said, ask me in a couple years. So, so there's not even visibility on the trajectory of profitability yet. Um, and so I, I just want to make clear, it's not that these things are not going to be real businesses. I just want to make clear to investors here that if you're buying these companies today with a view to that business, you're going to be waiting a long time. Is that, I mean, is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, that, no, that's fair. That's, that's, no, you're, you're spot on. Dude. It's, 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 a, it's a ways away. You're, that, that's, why it's, that's why I think the large integrated oil companies and, and the existing energy companies are the best companies to, to own and operate these assets. They've got the, inter, uh, the, the inter, energy expertise. They've got the technology expertise. They've got the engineering expertise. And they can build these, these businesses. And they're committed. That's the key thing. They're committed to decarbonization. So, but, but that takes time, as you, as you highlight. Um, and so, so yeah, that, that's kind of where we are in the cycle. So, Drew, uh, so it's interesting because you guys are kind of providing us with a now and later playbook, I guess you could say. Um, and so, Drew, I guess yours would be more of the now playbook, right, the infrastructure that you're talking about. So what are some of the names that you think are, are sort of doing some of these build-outs now or are poised to capitalize on this? So I'm going to step back for one second mm -hmm. and just add one more thing to what Rob said. Those big energy companies also have free cash flow to fund decarbonization, energy transition, and so on. A lot of these peer plays in a standalone basis were running out of cash. That really became a problem when the Fed started raising rates, when we started seeing capital markets close off for these companies. And then all of a sudden, in, in a blink of an eye, a bunch of these names are down 80%. This is what got us focusing on who's profitable now or will be very soon, who has free cash flow and who has operating leverage and their little segment of the infrastructure build out. A couple names that really stand out to us, ACOM, it's an engineering and construction company. And again, they support broader infrastructure, but part of their business also supports pollution solutions, energy transfer and so on. Another stock that might be off people's radar GTLS, this plays again to uh, LNG. Again, we're going to need more than just a clean transition. We're going to need that in between period as well. Um, this company also plays to energy storage. Again, more of a builder in the infrastructure space. Both of these are SMID cap names. Both are in the industrial segment. I think this is a way we can do this now. And then when we feel better, about capital markets, interest rates, and funding some of the longer term plays in the space, I think we rotate to the pure plays later on. Um, and it's interesting because I look at some of these uh, companies you're talking about, like Martin Marietta Materials, for example, is up, I'm surprised about this, 86% or so over the past year. So we've seen this, this rally. Guys, I want to ask both of you briefly, and, and Drew, you already touched on this, um, what the political risk is here, right? If you do see, um, if, if President Trump retakes the presidency, for example, um, and does goes through with his threat to sort of pull back on some of these measures that were attached to the IRA, um, even though he alone can't scrap the bill entirely. Rob, what is the risk? You said there's a real commitment here on the part of the oil and gas companies. What happens, though, if the politics change? Well, the, the, they, they do. A lot of these technologies do rely on tax credits, Julian. There's no doubt about that, and everybody knows that. So, if if we would see uh, some some pullback in, in, in tax in the tax credits, that would, would would likely slow down the capital investment. I still don't think it reduces the the, the desire to decarbonize, but it would definitely reduce uh, the the commitment and the and because the economics just wouldn't work without the tax credits for a lot of these technologies. Right. And, and Drew, what about you? It sounds like you're trying to find plays that are sort of agnostic. Yeah, it's funny. Not everything in clean energy needs a tax credit. A lot of it does. I, I agree with Rob there. But utility scale solar, for example, actually has decent economics. So there are examples of clean energy plays where we have the baby basically being thrown out with the bathwater here. So again, where we think we can survive some of the near-term political issues, near-term rate issues, near-term capital markets being open or not issue, uh, you need profitability and you need, and you need near-term cash flow. So that's why we're looking for clean energy plays with profitability now. I can't stress that enough. Guys, really interesting stuff, thought-provoking here. Um, really appreciate it. Rob and Drew.
All right, take care, guys. We are minutes away from the closing bell on Wall Street. Stocks climbing to new records while Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell held his news conference. And so we've got uh, all three major averages. It looks like set for a record close. What's interesting is the optimism has also sparked a turnaround in crypto. Bitcoin, after falling, I believe as much as 7% earlier today, now higher, now climbing back towards 66,000 here. So I guess those the Bitcoin bulls would say, no matter what happens with the Fed, I don't know, Bitcoin goes up, or risk on. I guess that's a way of explaining it. All right, we got you covered with all the action following the closing bell. Keep it right here. There is the closing bell on Wall Street, and now it is market domination overtime. Let's get you up to speed on the action from today's session. Josh, of course, we had a rally that really took hold after we heard from Jay Powell, after we did not see any significant change to the expectations for the Fed. The dot plot still showing three rate cuts this year. And in fact, the Fed raising its forecast for GDP, even as it also raised um, the forecast for inflation expectations as judged by the dot plot or the summary of economic projections, as it's technically called. So it looks like the Dow closing at a record in today's session with that 400-point gain on the day. The S&P 500 up 9 tenths of 1%, I believe, also 
trading uh, closing at a record on the day, as is true of the Nasdaq as well, up one and a quarter percent. And as we saw stocks go up, we saw yields go down here today. Not a big move, however, in the wake of the Fed. And perhaps that was something else that was somewhat reassuring to investors. Now, taking a look at some of the other movers and under the hood during in today's session here, leading the gains, we actually had consumer discretionary. This, this to me is especially interesting, given the fact that we had Caring, the owner of Gucci, issue a warning today that sent that stock sharply down. But consumer discretionary broadly doing well today, up one and a half percent here in the U.S. Financials, gaining communication services, industrials, everything up except for energy and healthcare. And energy has been a strong performer as of late. So this is a bit of a shift from that. And then taking a look at the Nasdaq 100 and some of the big movers here uh, with no sort of gains in yields, I guess. You could see the strength in technology in particular. So all of the, I know we're not calling them that anymore, but the Magnificent Seven, still up today, Josh. So Julie, here's some more green on your screen for you. Let's take a look at Astera Labs, the public market debut for this chip connectivity company, and it soars in its trade, trade view. Look at that move there. Its investors, by the way, include Intel's venture arm. Sutter Hill Ventures is its biggest shareholder. Bloomberg pointing out this is the fourth largest listing in the U.S. this year, coming, of course, though, just one day uh, before high-profile Reddit is expected to start trading. Astera makes, by the way, semiconductor-based products. They're used to uh, build out cloud and AI infrastructure. As we know, Julie, investors are very hungry for ways to play AI, and now some clearly believe they've Found another one here. Yeah, and that I, I'm surprised at the stock gain that we saw today. When I checked earlier, it was up something like 55 percent. So obviously, extended those gains before the end of the day. This um, first, the Astera raised the range for the IPO on Monday to 32 to 34 dollars. Then they actually priced at 36 dollars. Mm -hmm. Then they began trading at 52.56. So that gives you an idea of the demand that we saw. Now we might see something quite different for Reddit, which, as we know, its valuation has shrunk over the past couple of years um, in a different business, clearly. But just interesting that this one kind of snuck in there. Reddit, yeah. maybe because it's a better known name, if you will. Um, but interesting to see this one the do journal, so well. by the way, also NVIDIA CEO Jensen Wong provided an endorsement yes. in Astera's Roadshow video pitch. So Indeed. that also doesn't hurt. No, it doesn't hurt. All right, Federal Reserve Chair Jay Powell holding firm on the central bank's path to cutting interest rates three times this year. Josh Schaefer, of course, watching the presser, watching the action today. What are some of your takeaways from the day? Yeah, so watching the presser when we all started to get a little bit excited in the newsroom was when Jerome Powell said the story for inflation hasn't really changed. And that seemed to be, I think, the broad takeaway for us and I think the broad takeaway for markets. We just highlighted all three indices, all three indices just hit record high closes, right, guys? If the story hasn't changed, then the rally we have been seeing, maybe the narrative there hasn't changed and we saw a lot of, a lot of similar action that we've been covering over the past couple of weeks. The other thing with the story hasn't changed narrative that's interesting is just investor expectations for rate cuts, right? The Fed coming out saying that they still expect three rate cuts. That's what the market had been pricing in. I was taking a look at sort of where markets had priced rate cuts after Fed meetings, the last couple of Fed meetings. We're basically back to where we were in November which is interesting because if you remember November, we were looking at three interest rate cuts and what has changed though, so the story for inflation maybe hasn't changed overall, it's gonna be bumpy, it's gonna come down. What has changed is economic growth. The Fed coming out today and saying that they think economic growth is gonna be better than they initially thought. We should note that's really coming to, as Jay said, to the market consensus. That's been a consensus for a little bit now. But that's what the trade was, right, guys? That's our second takeaway here. You saw a lot of people buying in sectors that benefit from economic growth. Consumer discretionary doing well today. You see industrials doing well, materials doing Small well. Small caps. Small caps yep. doing well, right? That broadening trade was where things were bought. And kind of a broad takeaway from that was it wasn't necessarily big tech. Julie highlighted that, yes, some of the tech stocks did well, they were up. But it wasn't only It tech. wasn't only tech. And we're looking at... Uh, I was struck by consumer discretionary being the best performing group. And that stock was one of the worst performing sectors of the year entering today. It was up, but it was not outperforming the market and it was not outperforming most of the sectors. Because six of the 11 sectors were up over 1% mm. following, following this meeting. I mean, that's just a broad takeaway of, oh boy, we are actually 
broadening out. Like, let's stop talking about it just being, I think we have moved on from that conversation, but it's really over now. We're talking about an actual broadening here. Yeah. It's interesting too, Josh. I just feel like, you know, how much is this, after you got those firmer than expected inflation prints, CPI and PPI, how many really thought, you know, all right, it's not going to be three, it's going to be two, but Jay Powell clearly just is not blinking. Right. They're not blinking. And the other thing, too, that I really took note of, because we love to talk about the labor market, and I love to talk about the labor market, he said that stronger than expected labor market data isn't necessarily going to mean there's no cuts. He was talking about how when you've seen the growth in the labor market that they had over the last year, that came with supply growing, right? So now we're just talking about the economy getting bigger. And I think that also opens up people's eyes to maybe the economy can just keep growing and, again, good economic data isn't bad news for stocks. So then again, that would be an overall good story, right? I, I hate being so overly positive right now, but it's hard to, I, I, I don't know, it's hard to find you have a lot of company things, Josh, things to be negative. Yeah, right? a lot of positivity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know, we just closed at record highs across all three indexes. Yeah. Hard to be too negative. It is hard, but we're gonna we'll keep find something. Fun. Well, I'm sure we'll yeah. find oh, something. We'll find something, I'll come back tomorrow and we'll have only bear takes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Josh, appreciate it. Well, we've got earnings news that we got to tell you about as well from Micron, the memory chip maker. Um, the forecast is setting the shares higher by some 10 percent right now. Third quarter adjusted revenue the company sees at six point four billion dollars to six point eight billion dollars. That's around this versus around the six that analysts were looking for here. And I'm also seeing uh, that the adjusted gross margin for the third quarter, this is its fiscal third quarter that it's projecting. Uh, gross margin estimated at 25 to 28 percent, again, far above the around 21 percent that analysts on average had been estimating here. This is after it looks like second quarter numbers beat as well, but it's really the third quarter numbers that appears that investors are keying in on. Yeah, what's impressive about this too, Julie, is heading into this print, stock was already a monster. It was already up about 10 percent this year. It was already about 60 percent over the past 12 months, in part, of course, because we know we talked about this with, with analysts who cover the name. Increasingly, investors pile in because they see this as, as a smart AI play as well. Yes. Um, and, you know, memory, I think even more than other parts of the semiconductor stack is sort of commoditized, right? It goes in cycles. And so Micron has been a victim of that at times, but now more recently has been sort of riding the uh, AI enthusiasm. It looks like I'm also seeing the company um, has a quarterly dividend at 11 and a half percent, 11 and a half cents. It did keep that same dividend that it has had. Um, and I'm just looking at the statement here to see if anything stands out. The company's talking about a, it's going to have a strong fiscal second half of the year. And mentions AI. Uh -huh. That is Sanjay Mehotra, the uh, CEO, says, we believe Micron is one of the biggest beneficiaries in the semiconductor industry of the multi-year opportunity enabled by AI. And investors agree, apparently, at apparently. least in the initial after hours yes, here. Yes, we'll see what the call brings. As stocks close at records, Treasury yields pull back after the Fed decision and Fed Chair Jerome Powell reiterated the outlook of three rate cuts this year. Joining us now is Adam Abbas, Harris Associates co-head of fixed income and portfolio manager. Adam, it's good to see you. Good to see you. So maybe get to, listen, you heard us talking, Adam. It is risk on right now. We've got a record close to the Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ. Um, so investors clearly like what they heard. But what did you make of what kind of the Fed did and said today? Well, I think Jerome did a really good job today. I think there was a tendency, there, there was a risk really that he would come in and speak a lot about the last two inflation prints, the hotness, maybe even pivot hawkishly from a really dovish meeting in December. And, and the risk there is that we just have a Fed that's flip-flopping. You kind of lose credibility. And what he said, and I think he said correctly, was we had two data points. Some of that was seasonal. Uh, we're going to wait for more uh, data points to confirm a trend. And he gave us evidence that the labor market it can be strong as well. And that there's no reason to change estimates. You saw the dot plot still had three cuts. Mm -hmm. And I think all of that was appropriate. I think he did hedge with a little, you know, we are data dependent. If uh, inflation were to remain sticky, we would make some changes. If the labor market started to break down, we saw a tick up to 3.9%, we would make some changes. But importantly, he really didn't change his forecast and he re reiterated to the marketplace why. And I think that was a, a great job by him. So do you share the sort of positive vibes that we were hearing about from our Josh Schaefer? If you, I mean, that was mostly seen on the, on the equity side, to be clear. Yep. But the idea that the Fed has done it, that they've engineered this thing and that it's worked? 
I think it's too early. Okay. I think Fair. it's too early until we when, until we're down to the Fed mandate of let's say two or above, just above two. I think it's too early to declare victory. But again, I think this is the right decision. I think he gave us evidence that uh, he, he kind of leaked out. I don't know if you guys noticed that mm. he gave us the current PCE print that was intentional. Uh, to basically tell the marketplace, hey, those were anomalies more than they were at the beginning of a trend for inflation. He gave, gave us, he talked about the labor market supply, supplies coming back, can protect from a big movement higher in, in unemployment. Um, so he gave us all the right data to imply that they're not going to really shift course and that they're ready to cut when you get inflation below, let's say, 2.5%. And if you think about the skew here and the kind of the, the framework, if the labor market goes bad, we're going to cut. If inflation comes back down from those two anomalies, we're going to cut. And we're not going to raise rates from here. So we kind of are skewed um, to a dovish stance. Hmm. I'm looking at, at the, the tenure right now. I mean, so 4.3, call it. You know, where do you think the range is there, you know, near to intermediate term? We were talking to another fixed income strategist earlier in the show. He, he actually thought you kind of range bound here, 3.8 to 4.3. What, what do you think? I think that's right. I think that the tenure is, is probably not too far off where it should be. You know, at Harris, we kind of look out three to five years. We think fair value is kind of around three and a half to four and a half percent. Um, where I think it's attractive right now is kind of in the belly of the curve, the five and the seven year part of the curve. You can get real yields for let's say five years above 2%. And again, if you think the Fed will meet its inflation objection, you should see what's happening today, which is a curve steepening. And it'll benefit the five year, seven year mm -hmm. part of the curve. And it'll um, hurt the, the longer end of the curve. So, we like to be in that seven, five, seven year part of the belly. Uh, we think inflation, they'll have success. It will come down. Now, timing's, you know, the question mark here. And if you notice, he didn't say, yeah, we're going to cut, but we're not going to cut necessarily over the next two months. It may take six months. We may be patient. And that's the kind of that last variable here. Right. Um, and I think that's important. He's kind of given himself that flexibility, give himself a little out if some new things are introduced to the to his framework that may cause him to be a little bit more hawkish. Does that also imply then just not a lot of treasury market volatility this year if you see this? I think so. I think what, you know, my expectation over the next 12 months is that we'll, is, 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 as we get closer and closer to the actual cut cycle and we can really lock in on, you know, inflation is going to come down and stay down and that the labor market is okay. Like, I mean, it's going to, you know, be somewhere between 3.8 percent, four and a quarter. But there is no big spike in unemployment. Then the Treasury volatility will be lower and more range bound as we just have more visibility, and more confidence. The market has more confidence in the outcomes here. So besides, that's good for all markets. Besides the fives and sevens, like what's exciting in the? I mean, yeah. that sort of implies that the that the fixed income market is not as exciting right sure, now, which sure. has pros and cons. Yeah. But are there places that you think are being overlooked right now? Well, I don't know. I don't necessarily think overlooked, but I, I think th this might be a boring answer. Uh, but <laughs> if you can get 3% real yields in high quality investment grade corporate credit, and we believe that inflation is going to come down to 2.5%, 2.5%, and there's not structurally sticky inflation that's a lot higher than that, then, then real returns of 3% annualized in uh, asset class that defaults less than 1% annually, that seems really interesting. To me, so maybe you can classify it as boring, Stability but interesting exciting, to me. I guess. That's exactly <laughs> right. So I think it, it's not the time to really be too adventurous and go reach in the lowest quality parts of fixed income. Here, I think the most attractive risk adjusted returns really are in high quality right. fixed income, U.S. Treasuries, agency-backed securitized yeah. over the next three years. Adam, great to see you. Yeah, great to Glad see you guys. Glad you could be here today. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, Adam Abbas of Harris. All right, coming up, we'll dive deeper into the latest numbers from Micron and get analyst reaction as the stock soars on its numbers and its forecast. Stay tuned, more market domination overtime on the other side.
Micron just out with its second quarter earnings moments ago, reporting a big beat on its top and bottom line, and interestingly, its sales forecast topping estimates. The stock up 13% right now in the news. Joining us now is Rolf Bulk, analyst uh, at New Street Research. He is based in Singapore, and you've been going through the numbers here, Rolf. Um, so what stands out to you? That, that forecast in particular, uh, pretty big beat. Yeah, it is a big beat. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, yeah, what we see here is a 9% beat on revenue, and that is driven by an increased demand for, for DRAM chips, but importantly, also price increases in both NAND and DRAM. Now, the guide, 6.4 billion to 6.8 billion, which is 10% beat, and importantly, Cox, the cost of goods sold, is also guided up to increase 4% Q on Q. Now that signals that demand for chips is also is also um, set to further increase in the coming quarter. And, and Rolf, Micron, you know, it serves so many important end markets, you know, including PCs and, and smartphones. What are you expecting in those verticals in 2020, 2024? So PCs and smartphones, you know, the recovery has been a bit lackluster so far. So while I do expect those segments to recover, um, in particular in PCs, I think the recovery will be second half weighted. And in smartphones, there continues to be a bit of a risk of a pullback in the higher end of the market. But as it stands today, those markets should recover in 2024. But for Micron and the broader tech space at the moment, it is all about the data center. And for the data center, while high bandwidth memory, which is a massive topic in memory, um, doesn't do much yet for Micron today, it is set to inflect the growth in the remainder of 2024 and into 2025. Well, and does this sales forecast, I mean, this is not like an NVIDIA sized forecast like we got last year with this, the big shock forecast. But um, with the demand for a high bandwidth memory, do you think that there is room for Micron to even beat the forecast that it's giving today? If you're calling that sort of an inflection, right, will we see a, a big upgrade even? It's difficult to say at this point. Um, it is heavily dependent on, on price development. But what we, what we see today is that the industry and Micron are being very disciplined when it comes to adding capacity. Um, it, in memory, it is all about the equation between demand and, and supply. Micron is being very disciplined there. And importantly, the same goes for Hynix and Samsung, the other two major players in memory. So as long as this dynamic persists of the industry being very disciplined when it comes to adding supply, and demand steadily recovering, the setup is very strong for the remainder of 2024. And, and Rolf, I'm also curious, what do customer inventories kind of look like right now? What are the trends we're seeing there? They, they have largely normalized, uh, fortunately for, for Micron. Um, in data center, uh, that is the last segment in which inventories have, uh, have normalized. It's now very close to normal levels in that segment as well. So on that front, everything looks looks okay. Um, the industry still needs to work down the inventories that they've built up themselves. So Micron, Hynix, and Samsung do still have excess inventory on their balance sheet, and that needs to be worked down over the remainder of this year. Um, what we'll see is that gross margin as a result of those inventories being worked down and prices recovering, it should continue to trend up as of these levels. And the print that they just gave is a, is a strong testimony to that. And the same goes for the guides. So 25 to 28 percent gross margin versus market expectation of 20 percent is a, is a good indication that we are on track on that inventory recovery. And Rolf, finally, to take a step back from today's numbers, we just got the news today that Intel was indeed the recipient of a grant um, from the U.S. Commerce Department to build out production of chips in the United States. It's expected that Micron is going to be the recipient of another grant. How important is that for the company? And does that play into the investment case for the company also? It is important to, to some degree. Um, we see, we see in a, a large um, pool, if you will, of, of manufacturers. And that is, this is across memory, across logic, to, to get those funds to build out fab capacity in the US. Now, for Micron, um, they are, of course, one of the one of the few domestic suppliers of, of memory in the U.S. Um, it is important for them to get that subsidy to remain competitive with their larger peers in in Korea. Rolf, thanks so much for joining the show today. Appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you.
Paramount Global reportedly receiving an $11 billion bid from private equity firm Apollo to purchase its Hollywood studio. It's according to the Wall Street Journal. To note, Apollo is the parent company of Yahoo Finance. Our senior media reporter, Alexandra Canal, joins us now with the details. Allie. Hey, Josh. Yes, so $11 billion for its film and TV studio. Shares closed up nearly 12% on the report. But just to put this number into context here, Paramount's current market cap is $8.65 billion. So this $11 billion bid is significantly higher than the market cap of the whole company for just a segment of the business. So something that I think Shari Redstone is going to have to seriously consider here. For background, the Redstone family does control Paramount through its holding company, national amusements. Paramount had no comment on the report. Apollo did not immediately respond to the request. But this is one media company where rumors have swirled when it comes to a potential acquisition. Paramount, not the only name here. We also have production company Skydance Media reportedly interested. And they have a, a pretty unique deal of what they would want to do. They'd want to gain control of national amusements and then do a secondary deal to merge Skydance with Paramount. So sort of a two-step deal there. We've also heard from media mogul Byron Allen. He's very interested in the linear side of the business, which is interesting considering that's sort of dying right now amid the streaming boom. Uh, Warner Brothers Discovery, another name that's been thrown around. So a lot of potential offers on the table, but it's all going to come down to what Shari wants to do. She's been pretty hesitant to break up the company. She's interested in selling Paramount as a whole, as a unit. And this Apollo deal, they're only interested in the studio side, mm. the Hollywood side, the movie making well, business. I, I I want to dig into the valuation, right. as you just mentioned, $11 billion just for that part, yeah. which implies that they see more value there than mm -hmm. the, than the uh, market is describing. Do we know why? Like, are, are there, in other words, do analysts think it's undervalued? Do analysts think that Paramount is this jewel of an asset that is sort of lumped in with the rest of Paramount? I think it all comes down to the IP, right? I mean, Paramount has produced a lot of great Hollywood hits. The Top Gun sequel, for example, was one of the highest movies over the past few years. And then you also have Yellowstone and the success of that series. So I think the IP is very attractive. They have that built-in audience for a lot of that programming. Now, this report said that Apollo could team up with other companies to finance the deal. Maybe other companies are interested in, in acquiring that library, that content, you can look at something like Amazon's purchase of MGM. Right. That really helps boost their Amazon Prime Video service. So I think we're in an era where there's a lot of streaming companies at the market. Content is king at the end of the day. If you can get that recognizable content, the films, the TV shows that people are attracted to and bring them to your service as the exclusive owner of that, why wouldn't you want to pursue mm. something like that? So to that point, I do think it might be undervalued. I'm curious if we're going to see any notes that come out, any analyst reaction to this when it comes to that valuation point. Because now that that number is out there, mm -hmm. that means it's going to be expensive for any other company who's interested in yeah. potentially purchasing this. All right, good one, Allie. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. Time now for to watch Thursday, March 21st, starting out with the Fed. After a big day for the Fed, we're getting more commentary tomorrow from Fed Vice Chair for Supervision Michael Barr. Central Bank holding rates steady, and the new dot plot indicated that most members see three cuts in 2024. And switching to earnings, we've got Accenture, Nike, FedEx, Lululemon, and Winnebago all reporting tomorrow. Nike announcing earnings for its fiscal third quarter after the bell. The consensus estimate for adjusted earnings is 74 cents a share on revenue of $12.31 billion. The retail giant has been having a slow start to the year. The share is down more than 8%. And moving over to housing, new data on existing home sales due in the morning. That number expecting to go down for February. And finally, monthly PMI data for March coming out in the morning. Economists expecting both numbers for services and manufacturing to tick down slightly, giving us more insight into economic activity in the United States. All right, that'll do it for today's Market Domination Overtime. Be sure to come back tomorrow for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Stay tuned, we've got more Yahoo Finance on the other side.
A new note from Evercore ISI crowding a new set of stocks is the Electric 11. A few familiar Magnificent Seven names making the list too, as well as some companies with promising growth opportunities. For more, we have the analyst behind that note, Evercore ISI Senior Managing Director and Head of Internet Research, Mark Mahaney. Mark, it is always good to have you on the show. So move over Magnificent Seven. Uh, it's all about the Electric 11 now, Mark. I'm, I'm just interested, before we kind of dive into the specific names, Mark, you know, are there certain kind of common themes in this basket or are there, are there certain kind of common features attributes that these these names share okay josh so i don't want to get too carried away with the uh, you know <laughs> with, the, with the basket um, i just look at uh, about 16 18 stocks that we cover in the large cap internet space and um, fundamental trends amongst those 11 companies i'd call them the best names that are the uh, best basket best names that we look at. I would never put together a basket of stocks just in one sector. But if you wanted to, just in the internet sector, don't do that. But if you were, those are the best names. It includes uh, Amazon, Google, uh, Meta. These are all names that as a whole can can uh, compound at double-digit revenue growth for the next couple of years with margin expansion. And what's also new is that this group includes more and more dividend payers. Uh, there's like four of them in there now. And then uh, I think there'll be more because I think Google's going to join that dividend list. And then these are uh, companies that are also buying back their stock. So you've got 20 percent earnings growth. So that's premium earnings growth to the market, which is more as P500 usually grows earnings, high single digits, very low double digits. So it's just it's just the premium group. And if you can find them at reasonable valuations, where, where which is where I think most of these names are, but not all. But I think most of them are. And by the way, the last point is, if there's one major trend out in the market today, I'm sure, I know it's been overhyped, but it's still very important. And that's generative AI. I think most of these digital first companies are beneficiaries of, uh, of Gen AI. They're going to be able to figure it out. They're going to deploy it, or they already have, in ways that improves products, offerings, and processes. And I think shareholders will benefit from that. So, yeah, I, I like these highest quality names in the Internet sector and are about to love them. Um, Mark, um it strikes me here, you also talk about in your note on this, that demand trends are looking strong. But you can talk about internet overall, but even for the sort of subgroups that you're talking about, whether you're talking about cloud here, whether you're talking about advertising and retail, mobility and delivery, and then in entertainment also. And it doesn't seem like, from if reading between the lines of your note, that all of that has to do with Gen AI, right? So what is going on here that is supporting the demand across these different sort of subsectors within internet. You're right. So, you know, I, I looked at the internet sector. It's got at least nine verticals within it, everything from retail to dating, from cloud to travel. Uh, and uh, not all of them are going to be accelerated this year. Travel actually decelerates because we've had such a strong travel cycle post-COVID. But most of the other sectors, I think, are accelerating. I think cloud revenue growth is going to be faster and 24, then in 23, for names like Google and Amazon, and probably Azure too at Microsoft. I think retail will be faster for names like uh, Amazon. And it's a series of things. Part of it is, uh, frankly, we started off, uh, and this is also the case with advertising. So that's Google and, and Facebook. So I just mentioned a lot of market cap there. Uh, and we started off last year, if you remember, with a lot of um, uh, uh, unease, uncertainty about the global economy whether we're heading into a recession, there was a lot of softness in the end markets. That isn't the case now. End markets have firmed up. Uh, so that's part of it. You've got easing comps. But then each of these sort of areas has a couple of very specific catalysts on the advertising name. You do have the elections. You have the Olympics. Those are big cyclical events uh, for the entertainment names. That's the Spotify, Netflix. They both have successfully implemented new price increases on very large user bases. And so that causes acceleration in growth rates. Uh, on retail, I'd also throw out this um, this expedited shipping, this faster and faster shipping that uh, Amazon has been rolling out for a while, for about a year now, actually. And I think that kind of causes this, what I call shipping elasticity. The faster you ship, faster people shop. So I think that's also a factor. So this, uh, there's a couple of general factors, but there's also vertical specific factors that are causing growth rates to be the same. And in some cases, better this year than last year. That's good for stocks. Mark, there, there was a headline I want to get your thoughts on, too, because you call out Alphabet here. You know, you saw that report, Mark, that Apple, you know, might be considering licensing Google Gemini for future iPhones. You know, you, you cover Alphabet, Mark, so I was just curious to get your take on that report. You know, how much of a win would it be for Alphabet if that happened? And, and any thoughts about what you think maybe the economics of, of such a deal might look like? 
Well, I'm going to work backwards, Josh. I have no idea about the economics. And I don't think uh, Google or Apple do either. I think it's a negotiation. Uh, the comment, that all I've seen reported is that it could be a potential licensing revenue stream for Google, but I think it'd be relatively small. Look, I, I think the importance of the deal is just a reminder that uh, when it comes to Gen, a, Gen AI, um, you know, Google is pretty well positioned. Now, they'd be pretty well positioned with Apple anyway, given how big the partnership is between the two of them. But I think there's been one of the one of the several overhangs on Google stocks is belief that Gen, the Gen AI party is here and Google's not at. I think Google's at. I think they're at the. Well, anyway, I think that I don't want to ruin the analogy, but I think that the Gemini pro, Gemini product. Yes, I know we've had some high profile mis hits with it, but don't lose sight of what's the, the dramatic improvements that you've seen if you've been experimenting with Gemini, uh, Gemini for a while or uh, an ESG uh, their enhanced search offering. I mean, I think there's going to be a step up, like a, you know, a step function increase in the quality of the search experience for most people. And, uh, and I think Google's going to benefit from that. There's no sign that they're losing market share. And I think, uh, I think people are going to find more and more use cases for Google. I think this is actually going to lead to a material increase in the overall number of searches that people do with Google. That's a deeply contrarian point of view now. So that's why I think there's a little bit of an unnecessary overhang on Google. And that's one of the reasons why I made Google, for the first time in maybe two or three years, one of our top picks actually supplanted Meta. We like both stocks, but we prefer Google for the first time in several years because I just think there's too much that's been discounted out of the stock. Interesting. Um, I, I got to get your, your take, Mark, on Reddit. Now, I know this is not a stock you cover because it's not public yet. Maybe eventually you'll cover it. We shall see. We are waiting for the shares to price and for it to begin trading. It's in this Internet universe. Um, when you see a, a splashy IPO like this, does it have an effect on enthusiasm for the rest of the sector or does it give it any more firepower in terms of competing with some of the companies that you do cover? Well, I won't comment on Reddit specifically, but I think there's a, a read here. Like, um, you know, you're starting, you're starting to get more. You had several IPOs in the back half of last year. Now, uh, Instacart actually is the one that most comes to mind, which traded down, and people remember that, but they forget the fact that it's actually above its IPO price now. Look, uh, tech has been trading pretty well uh, for the last 18 months, 16 to 18 months. And valuations, you know, the, 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 it's a very different landscape. And so when you see companies go public, it's usually a sign that uh, companies and the people who are advising them think that the markets are now a little bit more receptive to risk. I think that's absolutely the case. Uh, that wasn't the case at the end of 22 and the beginning of 23. Everything was de-risked, estimates and valuations. That's not the case now. And if I'm right about these fundamentals kind of firming up, you know, kind of across a lot of different verticals. Yeah, that's why companies would potentially consider, uh, you know, going to the public markets. And that's not at all any recommendation on any, anything like that. But it's just stating the obvious. The, the, the more firm the public markets, the more reasonable it is that investors are willing to look beyond just kind of core group of stocks and look for other ways to get a return with reasonable risk. Mark, always love having you on the show. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Josh. Coming up, the dollar's superpower status may be losing its shine. We're going to tell you more on that when Yahoo Finance returns.
The dollar's superpower status may be losing its shine from Washington's heavy-handed sanctions to economic policy impacts. Our next guest says faith in the dollar is on shaky ground. In her new book, Paper Soldiers, Saleya Mosin details the growing risks to America's dominance in the global financial system. And she's joining us now to discuss. Saleya, thank you so much for being here. Lovely Appreciate to be it. Here. So the dollar's demise has been long predicted, and we've seen it hold up pretty well. But you outline some of the more sort of fundamental structural risks in your book. So give us, say, lay out top three for us in that fashion. I would say the top three risks the U.S. are our own internal uh, partis partisanship, the divisions across the electorate, uh, the fact that we play chicken with our public finances. I'm talking about the debt ceiling, the shutdown threat that is always looming. And the third one comes from overseas. The two main ones are internal. After that, it's overseas, that we have weaponized the dollar so much that there are, for the first time, people talking about de-dollarization, and there is more momentum behind it. But also the difference is that, like you said, every generation, every decade, there's a new kid in town uh, with an idea that, oh, the, the euro is new. Maybe that'll take over the dollar status. The yen could, someone else. But the difference right now is that the, the world economy the, the structure around G20 nations and everything is becoming more fragment, fragmented, just as U.S. leadership is looking uncertain. Hmm. You know, we, it's interesting, Slay. I mean, a lot of viewers probably watching this, you know, may not spend a lot of time thinking about kind of relative strength or weakness of the greenback. Um, maybe if they're like planning a trip to Paris, right, it comes in. But I mean, why, bring it home to why is this important for viewers? Why is this a topic they should be focused on? Well, there's two kinds of strength of the dollar. There is the exchange rate, where how many sterling pounds it can buy you, whether you travel to Japan and it's cheaper for you because of the strength of the exchange rate component. The other one is uh, how everyone in the world needs the dollar. The world runs on dollars. So you could be a business tycoon, an oligarch, a multinational company, or someone, let's say, in Ghana who is picking cocoa beans and needs to export that to any other country. You will be touching the global financial system. But what this means for the everyday person, someone who's watching the show right now, it means that we get a layer of safety because we own the world's reserve asset. It, it uh, gives a bit of a cushioning from external economic risks and headwinds. It also means that we can use it as a weapon to protect the country. Let's take 9-11. After 9-11, the first act in the war on terror was not a machine gun or a military tank rolling. The first act that very same month after the uh, terrorist attacks was George W. Bush signing an executive order, giving the Treasury Department more powers f to track the money flows that uh, gave funding to, for these terrorist attacks. Now, the, the reasons you outlined at the top for why the dollar might lose steam make sense. But when you look at that last factor, the, the sort of fragmentation around the globe, it's still difficult to see if it's not the dollar what it would be, right? So when you were writing, you know, how did you sort of examine those other contenders? Because that's been sort of one weakness to the argument that the dollar was going to fall. You're absolutely right. There's a couple of incumbent advantages that the US has right now. One, we are just so big. We are the largest economy in the world. You would have to take numbers two, three, and four put together to start outstripping the size of our economy. That means that anyone coming in with an alternate, whether it is the Chinese yuan, everyone talks about that, whether it's Bitcoin, or just oil, a commodity, or a couple of currencies bound together, the U.S. currency is so deeply entrenched in the global financial system. The world runs on dollars. If you want to make a transaction, you need dollars. To remove that and supplant it, supplant it with something else, there's a lot of technology that's, that needs to come into play. Oil, most oil trades are settled in dollars. So you would have to start unwinding a lot of that before you can add in someone else. Right. So it's not happening tomorrow. No, it's not happening tomorrow. <laughs> but Soleil, thanks so much. A big, important topic we don't talk enough about. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Coming up, NVIDIA is bringing AI to the power grid. We're going to speak with the CEO of Utilidata, a company using NVIDIA's chips to tackle utilities' biggest problems. It's on the other side of this break.
America's electric grid is under pressure. Plug-in tech like EVs require more energy, and adding renewable energy sources makes the system more complex. It's a lot to navigate, but AI can help. NVIDIA-backed Utilidata is looking to make the grid more reliable and resilient with its distributed AI platform. And joining us now is Utilidata's CEO, Josh Brumberger. Josh, it is good to see you. Uh, maybe to start, Josh, for, just for viewers who are not as familiar with your company, maybe just explain what you all do. What's the problem you're solving for? Yeah, sure. So, the, well, the problem we're solving for, if you take a step back uh, and think about what utilities are up against today, I think there are three major issues that are mega trends that are all happening at once. The first is the amount of customer assets that are now being deployed onto the, onto the distribution grid. So EVs and solar and induction cooktop stoves and uh, heat pumps. So lots and lots of new energy devices that are coming online. The second piece is we're about to see a huge uptick in the need for more power. So you're seeing AI factories and, and data centers and more manufacturing coming online. And then the third is, you know, the weather. We're starting to see these 500 year storms fairly regularly. So all these three mega trends are making it really difficult for the utility to operate in a much more complex environment today. And that's that's where the power of AI comes in. AI is wonderful and accelerated computing is wonderful at taking a lot of data and really complex problems and driving you towards, towards better outcomes. So that's what we're doing at Utilidata. Um, we partnered with NVIDIA to build a custom module that makes it incredibly easy for any utility or hardware company to start to deploy AI on the distribution grid. So Josh, um, talk to us about how exactly it happens, because not only are you talking about all of those demands on the system, you're talking about a system itself that is aging, that is overwhelmed, right? If you look at the utility infrastructure in this country, um, it's woefully outdated in many cases. So how does AI take that system, which is sort of not in great shape, and, and make it operate better? Yeah. A term I once heard was beautifully antiquated. Mm. The grid is beautifully antiquated, which really resonated with me. Um, so it is a very old but incredibly complex, getting more complex machine. And so when we looked at um, the needs of the distribution grid, the first question is how do you get better technologies into the environment fast? Because all the three trends that I just described, they're happening today, they're happening in real time, and they're intensifying. Um, what we looked at was the, the quickest way to get a major uptick in the deployment of our technology was via smart meters. And so smart meters, everyone knows what a meter is. It's at the side of your home and more often than not, it just is there to bill or maybe do some sort of elementary outage management. But really what you have is a, is a connected computer at the intersection of all the things that are going on, on the customer side of the house with all the grid reliability needs. And so if you put AI capabilities right there, you can start to spot problems ahead of time. You can start to see whether or not a transformer is going to overload because too many EVs are now plugged into that particular area. You can start to see some of the issues that may be happening from a power quality perspective because of an anomaly or because, you know, uh, quick moving clouds. So you just start to see and you're able to respond to all those uh, instances in real time. And right now the utilities don't have that capability. Josh, you know, it's interesting, NVIDIA is an investor in your company. I'm just curious, Josh, how that partnership came about. So we met NVIDIA in uh, 2021, actually, so before, before ChatGPT and the generative AI boom. Um, and we were both circling around the same problem. I think NVIDIA believed that there was an opportunity to take an incredibly important uh, machine, the distribution grid, and start to make it really smart, really connected, really optimized. And so they were looking at it from um, how can they think about bringing their technology into a new industry. And we had been doing uh, machine learning and real-time information to drive outcomes on the distribution grid for the last 10 years. So it was really a unique marriage of two skill sets. Um, NVIDIA, obviously, the underlying AI capabilities and the accelerated computing and all the tech stack that is involved there in Utilidata with that specialized layer of software specific to what distribution utilities need. It really was a, it was a wonderful partnership at the right time for us. Josh, um, very interesting stuff. We'll keep in touch. 
Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thanks. Let's take a look at some of the trending tickers after hours. We're watching Chewy shares. They are seeing a pop. Uh, actually, now they're, now they're lower after total net sales topped Wall Street estimates for the fourth quarter. The company also delivered better than expected sales per active customer, rising nearly 12% year over year. Adjusted EBITDA did surpass analyst expectations, but Chewy said it does expect to deliver continued adjusted EBITDA margin expansion this year. The company did report in lackluster net sales guidance for the first quarter. We're also watching shares of five below. They are down by 13% after missing their earnings estimates. The retailer also delivered lower than expected guidance for the first quarter. CEO Joel Anderson saying sales performance was offset by higher than anticipated shrink headwinds, which as we know, this comes from things like theft. That resulted in earnings at the low end of the company's guidance range. And KB Home reporting a beat on earnings for the first quarter, as well as forecasting higher than expected revenue outlook. The shares of about two thirds of a percent. Deliveries up nearly 9% last uh, year over year, with housing revenues up around 6% to about $1.5 billion. CEO Jeffrey Mesger told investors that conditions have improved heading into 2024 and they plan to buy back more stock. All right, that'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell.